Okay, good evening everyone. I'm Janet Evans, Chair of the CA Board of Directors. Please remember that tonight's meeting is being live streamed. You can find tonight's agenda and background materials on the CA Board's webpage and it's also in the description section of our YouTube live screen. Live stream, sorry. Uh, if you are virtual, please mute your microphones or phones unless you're speaking. And everyone in the room here, please mute your phones. Uh, raise your hand during the meeting. I will call on you in the order in which I see you. If you're virtual, please use the chat feature. As we move through the meeting, I will introduce each item on the agenda. And before uh, there are no votes tonight, if any point you have trouble hearing me or any other board member, please say so. <coughs> I will now call roll. Andy. Uh, present. Uh, Sherry is going to be absent tonight. Ginny. Here. Dick. Here. Lynn. Here. Tina. Here. Jess. Do we have Jess yet? Okay. Eric. Here. Ashley. Here. Lakey. Here. And I am here. Our timekeeper tonight will be Andrew Stack. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Ginny moves. I have a second. Second. Eric seconds. I'd like to amend the agenda. Uh, I'd like to amend the agenda to include a brief discussion of the uh, contract that was signed December 31st, 2021 on the area downtown the formerly Clyde's, but that area outside, which was open space and dining and the pavilion area, that we just have a discussion about it and give board members a chance to ask any questions. Do I have a second? I'll second. Ginny moves and Lynn seconds that we add an agenda item for a contract signed. I'm gonna do a roll call vote. Andy? No. Ginny? Yes. Dick? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Tina? No. Jess? Eric? Yes. Ashley? Um, can I abstain? <laughs> yep. Great. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and I will vote no. Motion, let's see. Uh, motion carries four to two no, four yeses, three noes, and one abstention. Thank you. How much time are we allotting for this? Um, I don't think we need more than 10 minutes and there's probably, uh, I was thinking under community operations updates or the president's remarks since we have. We don't have to decide where, we just oh, need okay. the time allocation. Okay, the agenda is amended to add 10 minutes for a discussion on whatever Jenny said. <laughs> Thank you. <Sorry>. Okay. <laughs> Can you restate what you said, please? Yes, what as, I said. As succinctly as possible. I would like a discussion on the contract that was signed December 31st, 2021, covering uh, the outdoor area at Clyde's, what was formerly Clyde's, and the pavilion area, um, period. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll be moving on to resident speak out. First up, we have Richard Briggs. Richard, you have three think, minutes. Uh, oh, I think sorry. we have to approve the agenda. Oh, whoops. Sorry. Sorry, I forgot. I That's why I have Andy here to keep me in line. Uh, <laughs> do I have any objections to the agenda as it stands? No. Uh, that's with the amendment. With the amendment. Okay. No. All right, agenda passes. Thank you, Andy. Okay, now we'll move on to resident speak out. Good evening. I'm speaking out tonight about the need to review anti-nepotism rules and specifically to advocate for exemptions to these rules for part-time seasonal employees. Our two children, Georgia and Julian, 18 and 16, are heading into their 13th season with the Columbia Neighborhood Swim League's Huntington Dolphins. 
They swam full-time year-round for eight and 10 years, respectively. Our son, 16, competes at the state tournament. This all started with the Columbia Neighborhood Swim League. Since they joined the Huntington Dolphins in 2010, the team, then in the midst of a six-year, 30-meet losing streak, has improved tremendously, doubling in size and winning roughly half our meets. We have a loyal, enthusiastic, improving group of swimmers and families. My wife, my wife served as manager for six seasons. It has been very rewarding and an incredibly positive experience with the Huntington Dolphins. It has been very gratifying to help this team progress. The CNSL and particularly our Huntington Dolphins have been a tremendous summer experience for dozens, if not hundreds of local kids and their families. One of our graduating swimmers called the Dolphins his swim family during our 2019 banquet. Georgia just accepted an offer to be the Dolphins head coach this summer after two seasons and is insistent. However, because of anti-nepotism rules, our son, who's highly qualified, is not eligible to serve as Georgia's assistant, probably for two more seasons while she is head coach. Georgia has been working towards her goal to be head coach since 2018. She's a coach for Columbia Clippers and currently coaches at the University of Maryland after serving as the Dolphins' top assistant last summer. Julian has no desire to move to another team and coach and coach them. He is and always will be a Dolphin, and he wants to continue to coach Dolphins after working informally with some of our younger swimmers last summer. This week, he turned down an offer to coach the Oakland Mills swim team. Julian holds two Dolphin team records and hoped to set a few more this summer that said that stood for 15, 20 years. His vast swimming experience and work with younger swimmers gives him a significant advantage over most other candidates. We've been competing against these local teams for years. There's tremendous loyalty and true pride in being a Huntington Dolphin. It seems to me that this is what CNSL is all about. CA policies should, 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 uh, should support this type of loyalty. There's much more reward than risk in allowing Julian to coach Georgia. Part-time seasonal employees have little to no ambition to rise up through the CA ranks. They simply want to get coaching experience, be recognized as good coaches, and work with their friends and teammates. Um, some seconds. siblings may not work well together. However, this can happen between coaches who aren't siblings as well. Our two recent head coaches, both good coaches, did not work well together. They were a prime example, but we made it work. Do I have much more time? 20 um, seconds. I'm just here. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, to a few of our 75 or so dolphin parents might object to two siblings coaching. I doubt it's more than a handful of most. And if the arrangement isn't successful, we can change it up next summer. summer. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I can't emphasize how enough how qualified and experienced they are. It seems to me that sticking to these anti-nepotism rules, apart, applying them to part-time seasonal employees simply deprives these young adults of opportunities they're clearly prepared for and deserve. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Ginny has a question for you. Yeah, Mr. Briggs, would you mind sending us your testimony, please? Your voice would fade in and out every once in a while. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. Um, I have it at work, unfortunately, so. Oh, no, no, you, uh, no, tomorrow's okay. Tomorrow, okay, fantastic. Tomorrow by noon, we'll be fine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, fantastic, I'll do that. Any other questions? Thank you, Richard. Okay, thank you. I just, I do have a question for the board, actually. It's my understanding that this rule has not applied to part-time seasonal employees um, for the entirety of CA's existence. I think the CNSL has been around since 1969. I understand that these rules went into place, were applied to these positions about 15 years ago. Am I, am I accurate enough on that? I actually don't know, Richard, but I can ask um, someone to follow up with you with the history of that rule, if you'd like. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, next up we have Heather Kick. Heather, are you with us? Okay, I don't see Heather, we'll come back to her. Christine Amari. Hi. Um, I wanted to speak tonight um, again about the uh, Sixpence Tot Lot Playground. Um, I wanted to express my disappointment in the board's decision not to fund um, a comparable replacement structure for the playground. Um, I've already spoken here in the past about the deep community significance that this playground has 
and how it's a touch point for making new connections between neighbors and the extended area. And I want to reiterate what a loss it would be to have this space taken away. Um, I also want to reiterate that 134 people have replied to the survey, survey that the Hickory Ridge uh, Village Board put out about the playground. Um, so that's an indication, I think, that makes it very clear that this is an extremely popular and highly valued playground that really is providing a lot of value to the community. Um, and, and, you know, again, I just, I just think that it would be a huge loss to have it torn down. Um, I also know that you've been made aware of the history of the playground, which is, it, it was designed originally by a resident of Columbia um, and has been around for generations. And replacing it with a structure that doesn't provide anywhere near the comparable value would just clearly be, uh, you know, just, just a loss for, for the community uh, with so many people who love and use it. Um, I wanted to touch on the importance of this playground as one of only a handful that serve children in the five to 12 age range. It's such a great thing for parents to be able to bring their children to the same playground and have them all uh, be entertained in, in the same area. And furthermore, it's hard to find free spaces designed for the older end of that age range. And I think it's really sad to lose that because I feel like we should you know, be providing more spaces to serve that group, not taking them away. Um, in the last meeting, some members mentioned uh, other larger playgrounds such as Bland Air Park. Um, those options are far away and require driving. Kids in our neighborhood on the older end of the age range the playground is designed for could walk there from home and play together. Um, most of the other options require driving, which not only removes that as an option for them, um, but is also, you know, just in general not environmentally friendly. And I think, you know, being able to walk to a playground uh, that, that serves a, a wide age, age range is a really nice thing to have in our community. Um, the Clemens Crossing Playground was also mentioned, but it has several drawbacks, less seating, no shade, and it's not available for general use um, for large portions of weekdays. Um, I would really like to urge the board to consider getting creative to try and find a solution here that would not um, cause this playground to, to be lost for our community. And, you know, that could include repairing the existing structure, which I think is definitely a possibility if the board were willing to consider it. Um, I know that, that there's damage to the structure, but I believe that it's not an insurmountable problem. And in fact, um, I, I think that it would probably be cheaper to repair the structure than it would be time. to replace it um, with, with a different structure. Christine, your time um, is up. If you could wrap up your comments, please. Okay, that's, that's about all I had to say. Thank you very much for your consideration. And I, hope, I, I really hope we can come up with a solution that, that doesn't uh, cause the playground to be lost uh, as a resource for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, thank you, Christine. Okay, next up we have Jennifer Lippi. Are you with us, Jennifer? Hi there, yes, hi. Hi. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I'm also here today to talk about the Six Pence Tot Lot, which holds such a special place in my heart and also to express my disappointment in the board for not yet funding a comparable replacement. So I'm hoping that all of you at this point, uh, I know we've talked about this many times, I'm hoping that you've all had a chance to come visit our tot lot, but in case you have not, I've got a picture of it here behind me. You can see it's a very special tot lot. It's a large structure and in a beautifully shaded location. It serves children two to 12 years old. Before its closure, it was always teeming with playing kids and adults gathered to chat and visit. You would have never been able to get a photo of it just completely deserted like it is in the picture behind me. Um, but now it just sits empty all the time, giving the impression of a sad, dilapidated place when so recently it was anything but that. Uh, my husband and I and our young children used to live in Baltimore City. We came to visit a friend here in Columbia in Hickory Ridge, and she was having a gathering for her child, and she had people come meet at this very tot lot. And my husband and I had considered the suburbs previously, but we knew we'd miss the walkable nature of the city. So we came to this gathering at this tot lot and said, what is this? This path, this playground, the pool up the hill? what is this place we were so excited and my friend said this is all columbia association and it's just lovely and amazing and we moved shortly thereafter and we've been on crossbeam circle since june of 2019. so doing the math we've lived here for just a few months before the tot lot closed and we've missed it ever since everyone in my neighborhood misses it and we're all shocked that not only has it taken two years to address this 
but that now there's consideration of not replacing it. This is what brought us to Columbia, what attracted us to the area in the first place, and one of the hubs of our neighborhood. Columbia has been named the second happiest city in America, and walking to this tot lot when it was open, I would 100% believe it. Every time we went to this tot lot, walking down the wooded path, I'm gonna get emotional. Passing neighbors out for a stroll or walking their dogs and heard the conversation of, of adults and the playing of kids. My husband and I would just feel so full. Like this is why we moved here. This right here is exactly why we moved here. Walking down the street to this large, multi-age, shaded, safe, fun playground to meet neighbors who would become our friends. I'm confident that these types of community hubs create better integrated, safer, more desirable neighborhoods where the vision of Columbia plays out in real time. A neighborhood that is essentially located, highly visible, boarded up playground that has not been that way for two years is on the other hand, not a great look for CA or for Columbia in general. And it doesn't contribute to the neighborhood atmosphere that is the Columbia dream. This tot lot has been closed for two years. And at the last meeting, there was some question about whether it's fully closed or if it's partially closed, can the swing still be used? And I just wanna assure you that this neighborhood, sorry, that this tot lot is fully closed. No one is going to trust their children Time. playing on part of a tot lot when the rest of it is fully boarded up. As Jennifer, you see, your time is up. If you could wrap up your comments, please. Thank you so much. I beg you to hear what I'm saying, what my neighbors have said to you both here and in their letters for the past two ye years. This tot lot is treasured to us. Please take the steps to repair or replace it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, next we have Ryan Gardner. Uh, hello. hello. Good evening. You, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I am also here to uh, talk about the Sixpence Talk a lot, um, express my disappointment with the decision. Uh, I, I can't beat Jennifer and Christine. Um, they they summed up the feelings and the passion of so many neighbors so well. Um, so I'll, I'm, I'll hopefully be very brief. Um, but yeah, I just, I just want to say, you know, I know if you don't live right here, you know, it can seem like one little piece of Columbia, but for the people who live here, um, this this is a really big deal. Uh, the, the playground's been around for something like 40 years, you know, rebuilt um, about eight years ago, uh, but basically to be the same same design uh, with some some added, you know, so that people can get sued as well because they made it a little safer. Um, but anyway, yeah, we, we love the playground. Um, like I said, I won't be, repeat too much. Jennifer and Christine said it great. Um, I, I had also heard, and, and to be fair, I didn't hear this, I didn't see this directly, but I'd heard some people were, there was discussion about, oh, well, we've got new playgrounds at the lakefront and land there um, as, as a sort of argument against a, a full replacement of the six pent tot lot. Um, and, and these, you know, for us, these, these are really not comparable. We're talking about something you have to drive to um, and isn't really in your neighborhood um, or, or a 60 minute bike ride uh, by, by a six year old and, and really not bikeable by, by a younger child. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's part of the neighborhood. Um, so, so anyway, they summed it up well, but uh, if you know, I'm asking, please, please reconsider, um, consider fixing what's there. Like Christine said, get creative. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's possible to seek more competitive contractors, save money to build it back like it was before, um, but, but it, it's an important part of the neighborhood and, and the plan right now is, is really not comparable uh, to what's there. So th thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, next we have Sharon Boys. Hello, hi. I have uh, Richard Briggs popping up in front of me a little, there we go. Uh, good evening, my name is Sharon Boyce. My family moved to Columbia in 1969. As a resident of Longfellow, I would like to thank the Open Mills Village newsletter for informing me of the proposed changes to the lakefront and for the opportunity to learn more about them tonight. Although I have recently received several double-sided advertisements for me to join a Columbia gym, I never received mailings about proposed major projects and changes in our community. To me, over the past several years, there's been a growing disconnect between what the residents who live here want and what the decision makers are approving. No one has asked the people who've lived here most of their lives why they stay, but common sense would tell you they liked what they had. 
No one was asking to shake up the status quo. We chose to live in a stable, well-established neighborhoods. We cherish our wooded paths and unique architecture. Why would we hide the Rouse building from view? Columbia is a planned community that took nature, the environment, and our quality of life into consideration. The forested stream valleys were intentionally preserved, and I and many others feel it's a unique and special place, but something has changed. As a resident, I continue to watch the new stewards, some who had no prior connections with our community and some who still don't, make permanently altering huge quality of life changing decisions for the residents and the environment without any inclusion from the residents, the ones who will be impacted the most. It seems like easements and contracts have become the standard norm for excluding public comment and apparently at times even comment from the CA and village boards until it's too late. Easements feel like a back door for development. The process should not be to grant an easement on CA property or our cherished open space first with a blank slate for private companies to design and profit from, then learn the plans, then let the community find out on their own, and often not in time to do anything about something they might not want. These easements typically say they're for the social welfare of the people of Columbia. Says who? How many acres of open space are currently in an easement? How many acres is the goal? How much has CA profited from these easements and how much were they valued at? How is trading the lakefront public parking lot and access to prime areas of the lake for another medical building and seating for one restaurant promoting the social welfare of the people over business interests? How does the 133 acre six mile long Lake Elkhorn to Long Reach easement that will remove up to 65 acres of forest <laughs> along the Elkhorn Branch Trail through three villages be for the social welfare of the people. Why didn't CA tell the residents about this before they signed the easement and not until after the initial public comment period ended? We have an election coming up. I wonder if we will vote to continue to shake up the status quo and look back with regret at our short-sightedness or will we recognize we have something special and decide to preserve it as the previous stewards had with inclusion and transparency? Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions for Sharon? Mm -mm. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. Okay, last up we have Greg Schwinn. Hi, Greg. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, Greg Schwinn, Hickory Ridge. Um, in light of the six pence debacle, uh, I'm using my three minutes tonight to Greg, recommend. Could you the board speak up, please? Policy. Hey, Greg. Uh, Greg, is there any chance you can get closer to your mic? It's yeah, a little bit soft in the boardroom. I'm not sure. Ooh. Gosh, I don't even know where my mic is on this oh, thing. Actually, um, that's better. Okay. <laughs> You're closer. That's better. Thank you. All right. Well, that's going to. Well, anyway. Um, anyway, and if you can restart the clock. Uh, in light of the six pence debacle, I'm using my three minutes tonight to recommend to the board that it adopt a tot lot policy. Uh, when staff presented last July, what staff presented last July was a great snapshot of the current state of play, followed by a budget plan to replace wooden play structures with ones made of metal and plastic, namely a play set called the Rascal for two to five year olds, making several replacements each year at an annual cost of about half a million dollars. But a select few tot lots may get bigger play sets that serve a larger age range, say two to 12 year olds. And in those cases, staff will come to the board for additional funding. The July 2021 presentation called this an intermediate replacement strategy. I'll call it the rascal plan. Um, there was no public feedback, no vote on the adoption of any policy. It was never called a policy. So let's talk about a policy because staff estimates that we're going to spend between 17 and 20 million to replace all 175 tot lots over time. More importantly, we're talking about a CA amenity that uh, our residents value very highly. Uh, we need to get it right. First of all, uh, the default should be that every tot lot have at least one activity for children of all ages, not just two to five year olds. One major benefit of our open space is the creation of healthy opportunities for kids. Uh, at the risk of sounding preachy, uh, we should all want to get children off the couch, away from the screens, the addictive video games, the destructive social media platforms. Our play areas need to reflect and respond to that challenge. Maybe stop calling them tot lots. Either way, leaving older kids out when designing our playgrounds is just crazy. 
CA then needs criteria to determine whether a tot lot will be replaced, and if so, whether it should be replaced with some standard set or something better, something different. These same criteria would be used to determine whether a tot lot should be eliminated or consolidated. In certain circumstances, determine where and if CA should build a new tot lot. In the context of community value, the two best criteria are the number of residences within a 10 minute walk and the availability of other playgrounds nearby. Now we can come up with a way to assign numbers for each criterion, then add them together for a community value score, or just do something simple like assigning a rating of high, medium, and low. These scores or ratings can then be open and transparent to residents. So there's no mystery, no shock when CA creates its capital budget. Tot lots with high community value get replaced with little discussion except for maybe whether to expand them. 30 seconds. On the other hand, tot lots, tot lots with low value could be nominated for removal or consolidation. So that's it. Come up with a policy and I'll even volunteer to help. Been around a little while. Um, I know the tot lots. I know CA. Uh, I'll tell you I plan to return uh, for a couple more meetings to talk further about this, uh, to go over some of the tot lot decisions that have been made in the past year or so. Um, and to talk about a couple other, other criteria that are consistent with CA's strategic priority of environmental sustainability and the relatively new concept of equity, which I think has a role in this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And if you um, have your comments written, if you would, wouldn't mind emailing them. Yes, Thank I you. do. And I will. Thanks. Any questions for Greg? Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Okay, has Heather Kick joined us? Okay, then that concludes our resident speak out. Okay, so first up, uh, we're on to our work session topics. First up is the public sewer easement in private storm drain and pathway easement for the medical office building in town center. Good evening, everyone. Um, nice to be sitting before you with a new hat <laughs> that I haven't worn before you before. Um, so I am my under the restructuring. I am now the manager of the Community Development and Real Estate Services Division in the Community Operations Department. Um, so I'll be presenting to you uh, two different easements uh, that are under your, uh, for your consideration. Um, the first is the wooden guardrail replacement. Um, as outlined in your packet material, uh, essentially there are several wooden guardrails throughout Columbia um, that need to be replaced and upgraded um, to meet current pedestrian and vehicle safety standards. Um, Howard Hughes is undertaking a five-year replacement uh, project to address these across Columbia and perform this work. Um, a few of these guardrails are located on CA land, and there is not currently an easement in place to provide the necessary access to address that pro replacement project. Um, so staff is recommending the board approve uh, the easements in order to establish the, the necessary access uh, for that replacement and the long-term repair of them. Um, in your packets uh, are both the vicinity map showing the locations of the guardrails that we have identified on CA property, as well as an example of the easements that would be established. Um, each one of these sites has a, a different configuration associated with the um, guardrail, so it would essentially be tailoring those easements for each of the individual sites. But for example, when, it, when a guardrail is on the right of uh, way and the CA line, we may only need the 10 feet. If it's a little bit further in, we'll need additional, some additional space. Um, and then kind of showing you guys an example of the existing wooden guardrails and the replacement, um, which will match those that are being constructed throughout most of the new development throughout Columbia. So, are there any questions? Yeah, one question. So why the transition from wood to metal? Is this designed to be a uh, pedestrian guardrail or a vehicular guardrail? It's it's doing both, so it needs to meet both safety okay. standards. A lot of these are located sort of in the roadway, but also right above overpasses, so they're trying to keep pedestrians from falling into the overpass and vehicles as well, yeah. Tina? 
Is there any sense of the schedule of which ones are scheduled for replacement or any recommendation that we'll be making if, if we do move ahead with this easement? So I, I would not normally have an answer for that, but I think Howard Hughes, I think, is, is planning the scheduling of that. So I'm not sure if, if Greg, if that's- So that's something to ask them? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm happy to, uh, to address that or other questions on the guardrails if, uh, if appropriate. So this is a project that has been uh, in the works for a remarkably long time. Um, we actually have been trying to do this for almost two years now. Uh, we're getting close. Um, and what's really going on here is so back, uh, you know, decades ago, the Rouse Company uh, wanted to put in wooden guardrails for aesthetic purposes. And the county said, that's fine, we'll let you do that, but you gotta maintain them. Um, and the wooden guardrails, when they went in, they looked good for five years, maybe 10 years. But after you know longer than that, they deteriorate and they require a lot of maintenance. They're frankly kind of a maintenance nightmare. Um, so uh, we've been maintaining them over the years, but we want to get out of the guardrail maintenance business. <laughs> uh, so we went to the county and said, if we replace these with new metal uh, guardrails that meet your standards, um, and that we actually, they're, they're painted brown, so they're similar to the ones in the Meriwether District, so kind of keeping a little bit of the idea uh, the original idea, but again, something that's not going to be, have to be maintained or replaced on a regular basis. Will you, county, uh, take on the maintenance responsibility? And they said yes. So that's kind of where we're at. We have uh, the capital approved to for Howard Hughes to go in and replace these, uh, as, as uh, Jessica mentioned, over sort of a five-year program. Um, and uh, we would like to get started on it. And that's kind of where we're at. We're, we, you know, these, some of these, most of these are on county right away. Um, but there are a couple of them. I think there's there's about 20 or 23. There might be a, a couple that are uh, uh, sort of, you know, sprinkled around here and there. We're not exactly sure where they all are, um, but uh, there's roughly 20 of them. I think of seven of those are on, located on CA property. Others that are in county right away uh, are, we have to go through uh, CA property in order to access them to do the replacement work. So that's the sort of set of easements that we are looking for approval for so we can get going and, and do the work. Mm -hmm. Jenny? Okay, thanks. Uh, so if I understand, Greg, we'd be approving a policy so that you wouldn't have to keep coming back for each one. E each site, we would be saying this is the overall idea that you have is fine uh, with these conditions and no problem so you don't have to come back for each one when it, you have to move 10 feet into open space or anything like that for safety reasons. And the other thing is it'd be your responsibility, <coughs> excuse me, to build them and also maintain them unless you turn them over to the county, then they would take on the responsibility of maintaining them. Is that is that what you're but trying to do? I'll Not answer the first question. So the, the resolution that's before you to vote on next time is for the seven CA land locations that yeah. require an easement. Okay, so that's and that's really the whole pick, that's that's all there are, right? So we'd be finished with it then? Uh, yes, I believe of, Correct. of those seven CA locations. Okay, okay, so thank you. And yeah, the in, other part in terms of the maintenance, it's the county has already agreed. Once we replace them, they will maintain them. Um, okay. So. Okay, so you may still own them, but they could take over ownership too, right? No, these are either on CA land or on county right away land. So we, we've been maintaining them, but they're not on our property today. Okay, so if they need a replacement? The easements will establish the long-term maintenance and repair. So the purpose of the easement is to provide the access so that either Howard Hughes or the county can access the site and replace and repair them in the long term. So it would be the county that would replace them or Howard use. Yes. Okay, I just want to just find out to confirm that CA will not be yeah. that's responsible for sure. India. Yeah. That okay. one I can say a definitive yes to. Yeah, I that's think that's what we're getting I at. Here. Know. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Tina, did you have another question or is your hand just still up? My hand is still just up. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll put it down if I can <laughs> figure it, this no out. No worry, if you just don't touch it, it should go away now that you've spoken. <laughs> All right, any other questions on the easements for the guardrails? Okay, let's move on. All right. So our, our next easement, you're gonna kind of have us going a bit back and forth tonight, um, as uh, I actually am gonna ask Greg to provide a presentation of the medical office building site, which is on the lower Whole Foods parking lot. Um, so he can give you a kind of an overview of what's actually being proposed on the adjacent development, because I think that will help 
provide sort of the vicinity map and the, the context for discussing the actual easements that, that I'll be presenting later. Um, Tanya asked if I would drive, is that okay, or, or do you want to? Oh, okay. Would you prefer? That's fine, yeah. Okay, so just say next, or you can narrow. So. Okay, or, or I can just drive with that. Uh, or you can just drive. <laughs> just with that. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's going to be mad Drew is behind you. Yes. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're dealing with some technical difficulties of having multiple parties virtually and in person. Thank you, Drew. Well, uh, thank you. So very happy to be here tonight um, to talk about uh, the projects that are coming in the lakefront, which we're very excited about. Uh, we have been doing a lot of work in downtown Columbia over the years. Uh, and most recently, the focus has really been in the Meriwether District. Um, we've done a lot. In fact, you know, we, we had the board uh, back a couple months ago sort of tour through the Meriwether District and the work that we've done. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's been great progress. There's still lots to come. We keep... Uh, We've had good success with um, everything from the residential, the, the office, and the retail down there. Uh, lots more restaurants coming. You probably may have seen announcements. We've got Medium Rare we re recently announced. We've got uh, Blackwall Hitch who announced themselves, which is great. Um, uh, so lots of good stuff happening in the Meriwether District, but we have been doing a lot of work, a lot of planning work uh, in the lakefront over the last number of years. And we're now finally at the point where we're ready to start with uh, vertical construction. Uh, so there's two projects uh, to talk about tonight. And you see here the the, uh, the one that's kind of grayed out is Lakefront North because uh, that's in, a little further in the future. Uh, and then the medical office building on the, the uh, surface parking lot south of Whole Foods is the building that you see in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, so super excited to get started with this. Um, uh, again, these are the two projects. And they are because these are adjacent to uh, uh, Columbia Association land with uh, being adjacent to Lake Kitimacunde being adjacent to, at the north end, the, uh, the stream bed that connects uh, the Little Patuxent uh, River that comes through and comes into Lake Kitimacunde, that watershed. Um, so they're, uh, you know, adjacent to those. And so there are, uh, you know, the land is affected with some water and sewer easements, uh, with some um, storm sewer easements, with some uh, the pathway connection easements. So that's really the, the, you know, what we're here in order to ask for uh, approval from the board. I guess tonight's not actually approval. This is informational. Uh, but will be coming to you for approval uh, on those. And the South Lake one is, is you know, that project, the, that medical office building is very close, so we're looking to start construction there uh, come June, Lakefront North. And so that, we have a specific request that is uh, detailed. It'll be, I guess, in front of you, maybe at your next uh, action, action taking board meeting. Uh, Lakefront North is a little further out. Uh, we are aiming to start construction by the end of this year, early next year. So we got a little more time on that, so we're not, we don't have the specific request that's um, you know that's part of this package tonight. But I just want to give you an overview of the project or an update. Again, uh, those of you who came down to the Meriwether District uh, a couple months ago, uh, we sort of gave you an update there. Um, and this is just kind of a you know a, you know further sort of, sort of show the progress we've made, we've made over the last couple of months. So again, you all are very familiar with uh, where we're talking about here, um, and this is a diagram showing. The locations you, the, at the left side of the, of the site is the medical office building site, and today that is a surface, uh, you know, asphalt surface parking lot. Um, you know, one thing that I know is of interest to the board is uh, stormwater and stormwater treatment. Today, uh, the stormwater, and the, frankly, the site to the north is also essentially almost all impervious asphalt parking lot that has no stormwater treatment because it was developed, uh, you know, four or five decades ago. So it was before modern stormwater regulations, which are quite stringent in Maryland, were put into place. Right now, there's no stormwater treatment on those sites. With both of these developments, um, all of the stormwater will become treated, uh, both for quality and for quantity, uh, before it goes into Lake Kittimacundi. So again, today, it all runs off directly into the lake. Um, all of that will be treated uh, as part of this project. The other thing that I think is really important to show in that, the, or to point out in that diagram is the importance of connections important of connections to the pathway system. 
Uh, we've been expanding the pathway system throughout downtown now. We've, uh, you know, we've connected the um, pathways from, uh, you know, from the hospital uh, through downtown across the, the, uh, the, the bridge, across 29 over to Glendare Park. That was one of the first uh, amenities that we put into place with the downtown plan. We recently committed, uh, com completed the connection up to uh, the Wild Lake Village Center. Uh, we also, and this wasn't in the plan, but we, again, we thought the, it was important. We made a connection around Merriweather, the Post Pavilion, Merriweather Drive, and then up Symphony Woods Road. So that also has the multi-use pathway. And you know, the connectivity uh, for biking, for cycling, for walking, um, maybe in the future soon for scootering, uh, will, you know, is, is just really sort of incredibly important. So this uh, diagram sort of illustrates some of those connections. The north-south connection here, is, which we call our Win Wincopen Extended, um, is again, a real, that's really gonna be a pedestrian oriented uh, street. So Little Patuxent Parkway obviously is extremely auto oriented. We wanna have a great walking street uh, and you'll see some more imagery of that as we go forward. And we wanna have that connect through to the Lake Kitimacundi path and to uh, the trail system that also connects both to the lake on the north end as well as over to Wild Lake. Um, and frankly, the, the whole 100 miles of, of pathways throughout Columbia. So um, the connections are, are really uh, important. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tanya Potter to walk you through in more de detail of this project. Tanya is the project manager, the construction manager uh, for this project. Um, so Tanya, the takeover for Great. You. And I guess I'll, 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 I'll drive for you. Okay, thank you. Thanks to everybody for your time and having us here. Thank you, Greg. Um, so the South Lake Medical Office Building, um, uh, we just we recently submitted our STP and received comments back. Uh, we're in that uh, response process. So, like Greg said, you know we're we're getting ready to start within the next next several months. So, um, you know, a lot of excitement on, on the project. Gonna hit the yes. So, like you're very familiar with the site. This is a great aerial that kind of shows the the connection, the proximity to the lake to the CA property adjacent to the lake and the connectivity to the the um, the forest restoration just to the south and and proximity to the Whole Foods. So this this great, um, really great aerial. So the the building actually will sit where, you know, the limits of the parking lot that you see now, um, and, and really push to the side where the where the edge of the woods is on the on the left side of the page. The one of the main goals of this we we need to retain the operations for Whole Foods for the loading dock for access to that lower level for the space as well as to the lake. So that um, that is we will be maintaining that and actually adding additional parking with a with a structured uh, two level structured parking on top of this building, which you know, I think the next couple slides will show that. Um, if you could go if you could go back one, Oops, there we go. Thanks. Um, so you know, that was one of the basic criteria is it has got to work. The, the site has got to function like it does to provide public access to the lake, into the building for Whole Foods operation. So we're basically utilizing that that asphalt um, a parking lot as you know, to, to build the site on this. This site does fall in a flood floodplain and um, how we're dealing with that is the floodplain is being retained but we're building up the base. So it, it basically, it becomes a chamber under the garage, the, the first level of the slab. So nothing as far as the floodplain will change of the capacity. Um, if for some reason there is an event, the site will, will operate like it does. Um, but it actually, with that opportunity, it improves to make a more level parking lot and, and help with some ADA connection issues, which we'll show you in a bit. Um, this slide also shows the, obviously the lakefront pathway and there's a southern connection, um, kind of a sort of a trailhead. Uh, our, the, the plan will shift that trailhead north 
and we're providing um, a, an ADA connection to that trail as well as a, the short, a shorter connection non-ADA to that pathway, trying to work with the existing grades. And that's basically the area, that green area, you see the red cars at the border, that's the lot we're talking about that's um, CA uh, impacted area. And then also want to call your attention to the left side where the dotted pathway line um, indicates. This is an easement that CA has with HRD um, entity and Howard Hughes entity for um, access, uh, um, pathway easement access for, for that use. And also um, chompers, I think that's the, the dock, the loading, um, the dock launch for that. We'll be doing some improvements while we're, you know, in the area to help that that access um, make a little bit uh, easier maneuver and getting in and out of the lake, which we'll have, we can show you on a detail for that. Um, okay, and then and here's another really great shot of the lake and the showing the Rouse building and the site. And then the next slide shows, you know, the view of, of tomorrow. This is the positioning of of the office building. Like I said, we really pushed it south to give breathing room to the um, to the old Rouse headquarters, the Frank Geary building, to give it that space to help with operations. And also we've created this, um, as you'll see later, and you can see in this photo, it, a terrace that creates this public um, elevated connection, which will be on grade with the Whole Foods parking lot. So pedestrians can walk over, you have this, these great views of the lake, and then a stair connection down, and then our ADA connection will be as it is today down in the, the surface lot. Uh, this is a, a, a nice rendering. It's from the Whole Foods lot. If you look south towards the lake, and one of the, the fun challenges of this building is how, you know, to site it, to keep the loading dock, the, that ramp down to the loading dock, to the lower, re, the lower retail uh, office area, and, and maintain that parking operation. So this, this gives a great view of the two levels of parking. Um, it's non-exclusive. It's open to the public. It's, it will be obviously used during um, business hours, but open at any time. Anyone can park here and actually great for, for weekends. So we're almost, almost doubling the, the parking capacity for this lot. And then you can see at the very end, um, and I think I have, I have some other uh, renderings that really show this trailhead. We're trying to maintain these views and um, at the lower end, and then you can see this pedestrian bridge that takes you from the Whole Foods into this public terrace and, you know, just creates kind of this bird's eye view, kind of this pure, pure look. Here's an overview. Um, obviously the lake is on the right. It shows that the bridge, a vehicle connection. So the access to this, to a drop off to the building comes off the existing Moore Circle ramp. You come down and then there's a separate ramp that takes you under the building. People can drop off their their, their loved ones, their friends, and then they circle around. They can park below or they can park in the um, in the lots across. What we're doing with the parking for Whole Foods is there. it's all shifting north. And then the dedicated space is kind of in front or not the dedicated, the parking space is located in the front will be primarily used for the medical office or, or public use to that. This, um, yeah, so the terrace gives a great opportunity for, for, for public uses. Um, we envision, you know, fitness classes, markets, everyday gatherings, kind of um, uh, uh, impulsive gatherings. And also like we did in Color Burst Park, in a much, much smaller scale is to create some really great programming to complement what's going on with Lake District, um, and, and, and augment it. So we really want to see this. It's a very open, it's a very flexible space. So it's, it, you can do many, um, many type of, of pop-up opportunities. So that's, um, that's how we envision this use. And this is a view, this gives a great view of the lot um, um, uh, for, for CA that is affected. So basically you can see how the grades work here where that green van is located is maybe just south where the light pole is, is where this ADA 
connection from um, from the parking lot will come and it'll travel south. It, it just needs to be longer. Again, we're trying to work with the grades, um, be very minimal um, rework there. And then we're, we're, excuse me, providing another connection more north. Um, this area also has, uh, there is an existing sewer line that basically crosses this parking lot. So we just have to divert it around the building and, and connect to that existing sewer. So there's a, the sewer will kind of straddle both properties. Um, so that's why we, we need that. Um, easements. This is a great shot showing the, I'm getting an echo. Okay, this is a great shot showing the, um, the ADA connection is in green. So from that north trail, new trailhead, it connects down to the existing pathway. And then in yellow is another um, connection we were working with CA staff. You know, they said people are going to take the shortest route, right? So um, we, we made an additional connection. It is not ADA just because of those grades I was showing, but it gives two opportunities um, to get to the pathway. And this is a, a rendering of the vision of this trailhead. So adding more bike racks, adding benches, signage, really kind of creating cordoning off or, or uh, painting off some areas that people know you know, that it's there and create nice drop-off opportunities. This is the existing pathway showing that, that um, southern connection. And again, you can see how the grade works here. And, um, and then what we're doing on the next is we're, we're flipping the, this is, this is the, that ADA pathway connection, how it's gonna parallel the, the, uh, the existing the lakeside path to make that connection. And then this is, that was a great shot of the stair. You can see it in here as the stair comes down the terrace, it becomes this element, this intriguing element to play with. Um, and you can see the, the envision of the, the bike racks and, and, and a, just a nicer, nicer connection that we have. Um, one thing we do wanna call out is, is on, on, the, um, on the garage part is we really wanted to take a natural effect for for screening of this garage. Um, so it's steel cables and that these vines, they're, they're, they're native. They bloom from May to October, um, very fast growing from 20 feet to 50 feet a year um, with all types of flowering blossoms. They change per the season. So we're very excited about that, trying to utilize um, uh, you know, more of a, a natural type of, of solution a softer side and then these are this is more of a detail of the affected areas so in the blue is the lot 25 the ca property and the new pathway connection um, ada pathway kind of straddles a little bit into ca property the new ada connection um, requested by staff you know that's that's within your your lot um, the sewer Connection is right at the um, kind of the page left. There's an existing sewer manhole that we're going to be tying into. So that straddles both um, CA and, and our property. And then lastly, I didn't mention in this slide, you'll see Greg had mentioned the stormwater management. So we're putting in a stormwater scepter and chamber that um, will handle all the stormwater runoff from our building, that whole lot. It goes in, it's filtered it's held and it's just a slow release into, there's an existing outfall that will be um, improving and, and will be filtered water going into the lake so that the storm water outfall remains in its, in its location is just now gonna accept filtered water. There's an existing storm water outfall that we're abandoning on the south side. Um, again, it doesn't, today it's just, it's just runoff. It doesn't get filtered. So, you know, just a great um, site improvement for that. And then um, the other piece, which I, um, we mentioned, this is that pathway um, connection of, that we have an existing easement. Because of the, the challenges of the site, we will be using that in the first um, few months for construction access. Um, it'll be, um, it'll be uh, protected upgraded to handle the vehicles. And then once we're done, it'll be cleaned up and, and will be, you know, back to its pedestrian, pedestrian use. So that's um, something that we're doing. And then at the, you'll see that little triangular piece 
uh, we're working with staff to improve that um, that connection so um, chompers can go in and maneuver much more easily into the boat launch and out we have to move a light pole um, but we you know we're wanna while we're there we can make some some better accommodations for that for that operation and I think that's it take back over to finish up the medical office building. Okay. Yes. I almost got it. I almost got it right. You got help right behind you. Did I click the wrong one? See? Drew is well versed at saving me from technological <laughs> issues. <laughs> so. Just continuing to finish up the easements discussion that we've had, uh, Tanya provided an excellent overview of their project and what they're proposing for the development, which I hope kind of provides the context for this discussion, which is very much focused on the specific easement requests that we have reviewed. Um, so I want to highlight for you on the right-hand portion of this, as well as in your packets, is the highlighted pink lot 25 is the CA-owned open space that is affected by the easement area. Um, the medical office building site, the parking lot itself, as well as lot two is owned by Howard Hughes. So the easements themselves are limited to this little portion of property um, that sort of spans the space in between the development site and the lake kit. Um, if you will orient by twisting your head slightly, we are, instead of having the vertical lot uh, running north-south, we are now running north over here or south this way. So this outline in the blue is the CA property. Um, and then this sort of shows you, this is the medical office building site. This is the uh, new ADA trailhead ramp coming from the parking lot. It primarily is located on the Howard Hughes owned portion of the property um, with the exception of sort of where it dips into the CA space here. Um, that's really to, to allow the grades to slope down to actually achieve that ADA compliance. Um, as Tanya also mentioned, you know, when we look at a trail section, we, we kind of try to consider human nature and the fact that people, if they want to go north, they're going to go through the grassy spot. So we asked if they could incorporate a more direct route, which they have. Um, so those are the pedestrian and bicycle connections that are associated with the easement requests. Um, in addition to that is the uh, sewer line, which sort of, you can see this red dark line is the actual sewer line. And then the easement area, um, because it's a public sewer easement held by Howard County. Um, they have clearance requirements for the size of the actual easement area. Um, we then have two existing storm drain outfalls that uh, currently convey water from the parking lot site to Lake Kittimikwende. One is in this vicinity here, and that's going to be abandoned. The other one is highlighted in blue here. That's existing, um, but it's going to be replaced as part of the development project and make sure that we actually establish an appropriate easement um, for the long-term maintenance of that. Um, Jess, was there any thought to some sort of bioretention there? Is there not enough space for it? Or Well, part of the issue is that it's all in the floodplain, so there, there's not really anywhere for the water to go before it hits the same thing. So it's really about making sure that you can hold on to it and expand the capacity of the floodplain. That is my very non-technical, non-environmental scientist answer to that one. <laughs> so I will, I will let others more specific. But um, the county reviews the stormwater management for the sites. Mm -hmm. And I do believe the site has received an approved environmental concept plan. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but is it just because the storm drain poured into Lake Kittimacundi previously, it's still allowed to? Or is that not? Well, because well, typically that would not be allowed under current well, regulations. Well, all water has to outfall somewhere. So it has to go somewhere. So this is really about establishing the existing outfall. My understanding- uh, I thought Maryland law was that it had to be managed on site as much as possible. Yeah, so my so my understanding is right now it, it outfalls directly in. Once the site is redeveloped, it will be filtered and treated through your stormwater management system and then outfall. Oh, I see. I, yeah. I heard you say that. I just wasn't sure what that meant. <laughs> so. yeah. there, there's just different 
different types of treatment. So a bioretention okay. is very specific kind. Um, right, I'm not married to that one. Okay. Just, I thought it was just pouring back out, but that was so, the first. So right now, <laughs> Ed is uh, right now it's untreated, so it goes in, uh, and and uh, in the future when this development is completed, it'll be treated both for quantity and for quality. And quantity means basically it'll be you know there'll be more storage. So the storm storm water when it falls on the site. Well, there's some storage capacity. Um, uh, uh, Tanya mentioned the um, uh, the cistern or storm scepter. The storm, storm scepter and chamber. So, so there'll mm -hmm. be some some storage, some capacity storage on site, which will also involve treatment. So like removing the uh, you know the, the um, pollutants or you know, whatever from the, from the runoff, and then it'll be slowly released. You know, sort of more in in uh, you know. So it's that's kind of the you know. I mean, I'm I'm not an engineer either, but uh, you know the uh, you know I know I know that there's there's treatment for both quantity in terms of like slowing the, the pace of the runoff and also for quality, which is the removal of pollutants through a filtration system, both of which will be done here. Yes, Dick. Uh, Dick, before you go, we have several people who've had their hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I also have just one more slide. Uh, sorry, that might, I didn't mean to that interrupt might you. Some I, just, I, didn't, you I kept answer. forgetting to ask that. So. Um, All right, uh, I, Ashley and Tina, we will be right with you as soon as Jess finishes her last slide. Just because it might answer the questions already. Um, so I understand it's it's hard to look at a construction docu document and actually understand what we're talking about for easements. So the next slide, um, we just highlighted the actual easement areas that we're discussing that, that you have to vote on. Um, the green is that pathway easement. Those are the ADA ramp as well as the one we asked for. The blue, the light blue is the public sewer easement. The hash dark blue, that's for the existing private storm drain outfall that's gonna get replaced after the development. Um, and then this red hashed one is actually for the existing Lake Kinmakonde Loop, which is considered a public pathway and easement area. As part of this, that's getting sort of realigned. And so its easement areas are changing slightly. So that's also being incorporated to make sure that that's updated. So I wanted to just provide you a little bit more color-coded clarity there. Um, so happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, uh, Ashley. Yes. Uh, so my question is about the medical office building. I know the last time Greg presented to us, he shared some of the newer buildings had received high lead ratings. Um, I was wondering if there's a rating expected for the medical office building. Yes, we are striving for platinum, um, which you know that's the highest level of uh, environmental sustainability uh, under the lead system. Um, we won't know if we get it for sure until uh, until after the building is built. Um, but we were, we're shooting for platinum. So far, you know, we, we've uh, you know all the buildings we've built so far. The first ones we built were silver. The last two, 6100 Merriweather and uh, and Juniper, uh, achieved uh, gold level. Uh, and and we're shooting on this building and also for Marlow, which is the residential building under construction, of Merriweather District, for platinum. We're also targeting platinum. Uh, in the Lakefront North neighborhood. Um, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to get there or not because uh, they, you know, lead, the way lead works is every few years they kind of up the bar. So the bar keeps getting higher and higher. My understanding is they just up the bar again on platinum. So uh, we are still striving to get there, but it, I, you know, I'm confident we'll, we'll be able to get at least gold again and we are trying to get to, to platinum. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, and so then I, I actually, to, uh, hold on one sec. I just wanted to remind the board that this is specifically about the easement. Greg will be giving us a presentation. I guess it's on the other building though, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just want to keep in mind that our portion of this is just approving the easement. So, right. you know, whatever questions you may have about the structure itself, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure they're very valid, but what we are t discussing tonight is the easement itself and next meeting we'll be voting on the easement. So if you have specific questions about the easement, I'd like to focus on those um, so that we just make sure that we cover all of the questions that might be around that particular topic. Mm -hmm. Great. Did you have anything else on that? Right. All right, thank you, Ashley. Uh, Tina? So the stormwater easement, um, to handle all of the stormwater for just this property, is any of the stormwater that's in any of the other parking lots being mediated because of this development? Um, I don't know, Tanya, I don't know if you can, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the flow, like obviously there is the, you know, to the uh, west is the surface parking lot for Whole Foods, 
Um, right. You know, part of that will also serve this building. That that parking lot was improved for stormwater treatment yeah. when, we, when we redeveloped Whole Foods back in, um, I guess that was 2014. Uh, yeah. But you can see yeah, that's there, a there separate. Those, yeah. It's a, it's a separate system, but that's, those were using bioswales, kind of a different treatment it was all throughout the parking lot, you can see. But this, this uh, storm scepter and chamber just handles that lower lot, the whole, basically, that captures that whole loading dock area as well as the building footprint. And the treatment now is basically let it run into the lake. The treatment in the future, because of the easement, will be much better. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sharon, I wanted to acknowledge that I saw your hand raised, but we're now in the board portion of the meeting and residents are not permitted to ask questions. Uh, so next up we have Dick. Uh, actually, two of my questions just been answered. Uh, I would like to say that I really like what you've done with the screening. Uh, I know that was a CA concern before and it looks like that's gonna look very nice. Thank you. Eric? I've got two questions regarding the what I'll call the green easement. Um, first question is how long will the path be uh, or how long will the path be inoperable for while while construction is going on? And my second question is I noticed that the green easement sort of crosses both properties, um, both CA property and Howard Hughes property. So how would that work? Is um, is it sort of a mutual easement? How, how does that how does that work? It's set up as a reciprocal easement agreement so that it essentially we're saying it spans both properties and we'll, we'll have it understand that it does that. So, yeah. so both both parties have access to right. both parts of both pieces of property or all I mean it's public it's public easement. So. Right. Uh, in terms of the timing uh, Tanya do you have a, a yeah answer to that? I can answer that one so yeah so it gets really the, the challenge is installing the sewer line because it, it, there's a pinch point on that southern section so working with our construction manager, we're trying to um, come up with a plan or are coming up with a plan that it's segmented. So we would have to close off a portion. We try to look at a study to divert pedestrians around. It's too tight to the lake and we don't want them in the construction site because it's not safe. So we're looking at you know one to two weeks, maybe a segment we'd have to close. We'd have to sign it properly at all intersections. Um, but once we open it up, it won't be it won't be paved. We'll put gravel or mulch or something. But our goal is to keep that pathway open as much as possible. But safety is number one. Um, we do not want to put somebody in in harm. So it's it's really that pinch point that becomes a problem. Um, the sewer's not super deep, but it's deep enough. You have to do layback, and you know you need some space to do that. So. Um, you know, we're, we're really looking at that too, because I know that's, that's a hot path. You know, everybody wants to use it. It's a, it's a great location. So, um, I said that's a priority, but you know, they, we will have a closure just due to safety issues. Andy. Uh, just one question, just to make sure, I, um, the easement that we're going to give for the private drain, then that will become the responsibility of Howard Hughes or successors. So we, so. All right, thank you. Eric. Uh, one follow-up on the, the, the green easement. So given the reciprocal easement, would CA still be responsible for maintaining and protecting that pathway? I believe so. I believe CA maintains that pathway and will, will in the future. Yeah, we currently maintain the Lake Kimikone pathway, um, even, you know, wherever it runs on the property lines. So I, I think it, it's in evaluating staff's perspective is there's no... There's no reason for us not to continue the maintenance into this pathway. Okay, so you'll be you'll be maintaining the flow into it. And Essentially, from yeah. from where it hits the parking lot and okay. starts becoming a trail uh, headway down to where it connects to the lake kit, um, sort of because it runs the line spectrum. But that's why one of the reasons for the reciprocal um, access and easement agreement. So. Okay. Any additional questions on this easement? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Lakey has something to say before we move on to Greg's presentation. Yes, I just wanted to quickly remind everyone, I said this during the board operations committee when we put it, you know, when it was voted to put it on the agenda, so I just wanted to say it 
since not everyone uh, attends that meeting. Um, so the easements were going to be in front of the board this evening and uh, based on the interest in Lakefront North during the beginning of the pre-submission and entering the STB process, there were a lot of questions from the board. So since uh, Greg Fitchett was gonna be here this evening, we decided to leverage the time and extend the invitation for him to make a presentation on Lakefront North. So I just wanted to clearly kind of make a, a marker line that Greg is gonna make the presentation about the components of the plan and the design and um, kind of those details. We are not discussing any easements this evening around this project. That is, you know, far in advance, you know, and obviously as staff gets more involved and, um, reviewing that, those easements, you know, come back before this body. But I just wanted to be clear that it's really time that we have the developer sitting in the room. And so if you have those kind of questions, Greg is gonna be here to answer them. <laughs> so thank you for being here though. Yeah, happy to be here. And actually, uh, uh, Tanya will be giving most of the presentation, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll kick it off. We are super excited about this project. Um, again, we have been, uh, uh, sort of going through the uh, public process on this over the past, we initiated that. We had uh, the pre we had two pre-submission community meetings for this project. One because we have an approved FDP for this site, but we're amending that. Um, so a couple sort of tweaks to that plan. Uh, so that's one process. Uh, the first eight steps of the 16-step process. Mm -hmm. We've also recently initiated the STP process. So we've gone and on both of these, we've gone through and both had the pre-submission community meeting, um, uh, and then we've also gone to the DAP, the Design Advisory Panel. So we've already, we have already had four public meetings um, on, on this project uh, over the last, course of the last probably two to three months. Um, but, and, and so we're now, I think we are, we're submitting both the FDP amendment formally to the county and the SDP uh, for this project to the county this month. So. Um, so we're, we are still fairly early on in the process. Ultimately, both the FDP amendment and the STP will go to the planning board. So we'll have that, that's, you know, they're ultimately the decision maker on this project, but uh, we are uh, excited to be advancing design on this. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a, it's a super exciting project. Um, it's a, uh, you know, this is kind of what we have today. Again, this is, you know, essentially a, uh, it's about a 12 acre site, almost a 13 acre site. It's at the very north end of the, the lakefront, sort of between Sterrett Place and then um, where the hotel in Little Patuxent Square is. There's a very large surface parking lot. It used to serve, there were two buildings. You can actually see one of those buildings still there. Um, in this picture, it's not there anymore. That's actually MedStar's former headquarters. Um, we demolished that a couple of years ago. So this whole site today is existing surface, uh, you know, surface parking, asphalt parking, that for the most part is, is unused uh, because it used to serve these two buildings that are now now since gone. Um, and it also includes those two, two building sites uh, the, from the buildings that we've demolished. So it's obviously underutilized today, uh, but what we are looking to do is create really a, a pretty spectacular new residential neighborhood. Um, it'll have some retail, it'll have really sort of more, uh, uh, I would call it neighborhood serving retail um, as opposed to the, the mayor of the district is more destination retail. It's more of a, a sort of a larger, has a larger sort of regional destination to it. This will be more neighborhood service serving retail, but really it's about uh, you know creating a great residential neighborhood um, with great open space as well. We've sort of changed uh, uh, the building typology. We are now uh, moving to uh, sort of, you know, two of these three buildings will be full steel and concrete construction, high rise construction, um, which is a, will be a first for us in downtown Columbia. Uh, for residential uh, buildings. Um, and we also, that allows us to create, we also are doing underground parking uh, on this site. So about half the parking will be uh, sort of under what you see here, uh, you know, sort of tucked underneath. And uh, also the, the sort of, you know, the way we are looking at the density and the massing of these buildings allows us to make them more compact, which allows us to have more open space. Um, so we, rather than there's, there's one sort of required major public open space that you can see, uh, the green space in between two of the buildings there, uh, the neighborhood neighborhood park, there's also another uh, comparably sized open space that you can't see in this image, um, we call Wincope and Green, that's on the other side of the building, uh, the new building that's sort of closest to the lake. 
uh, another you know large you know 20 plus thousand square foot open space that will be open to the public. So um, that's kind of the big picture of it. And let me turn it over, Tanya, to you to uh, to describe the project in a little more detail. Great. Thank you, Greg. So, like Greg had mentioned earlier, this. Um, the Wing Copen Extended, which is that middle street that bifurcates the, the property, is really envisioned as pedestrian focused. Cars can drive on it, but it, it's really to maintain a, a more pedestrian and bicycle friendly scaled um, uh, uh, roadway. And, and doing that, um, the way, how we can do that is if, if you're coming off of Little Patuxent Parkway off of Sterrett, um, we've created, uh, ex basically expanding that existing sidewalk into a multi-use pathway. It's called uh, the Wing Copen Promenade, which is part of the FDP plan. And it comes right down into the neighborhood square, that, that top right um, a park area. And as you come, you'll see affectionately called Parcel A at the top. Um, we make a transition to that stair at place street to the new Wing Copen as a more of a, a curbless type street. So, you know, you're not gonna have these, these big heavy curbs. Um, it'll be very open, very similar to what we have over at Merriweather at Mango, right off of uh, Color Burst. There's, there's in the area one where MedStar building is in our office, it's a very similar kind of an open plaza. So it really, um, cars will slow down and it's a different material. So we really want to bring in the pedestrians from Little Patuxent downstairs at this this great promenade. You can make you can make the bends down Wing Copen into you know streetline treats with this this really nice um, uh, curbless type um, street or go into this this public park. And um, how we do this and if stormwater is is big for us, it's big for for CA, it's big for the county. So the, the way that we would handle this um, and with knowing the parking structure is below is we're doing with trench, shallow trench drains instead of the big classic gutter pans, um, creates a nice system and uh, to, to capture that water uh, within the trees itself, they're, they're recessed into um, the parking garage and using silva cells, kind of a, a modular stormwater system, again, filtering this water using porous pavement. Um, so a lot of really interesting um, time, uh, you know, classic um, stormwater moves to really make this um, a really special, special place. So as Greg had mentioned on the, the top right is the neighborhood square, which connects um, the two uh, flanking uh, residential buildings into this public space, which eventually, which we're working closely with CA staff is to create a, a boardwalk um, connection or basically trails combination, probably boardwalk and pathway connection to the lake to lake trails across the way. So that's something that we're, we're, we're working on and trying to figure that out. And then um, we have the, the Wing Cope and Green just to the south, which is another, um, creates a nice uh, view corridor, you know, towards the lake, really creates a nice, again, a public space for that. And then um, trying to take advantage of the site, it's, if you've been out there, it's, you know, it's, it's on quite a slope. And so this is a, a really interesting section cut. It's the gray on top is showing the existing grades. And then right below shows how the parking, we're using that as to advantage, putting this uh, one level of parking below. And Wink Copen, you can see is right on top. And um, so, you know, you're, you're not having these big, you know, parking structures. So we're really taking advantage of the, of the site in, in a creative way. One thing I didn't mention, you could go to the next slide. I wanted to mention, so to create this great um, Wind Copen Wooner type streetscape, the light pink is kind of our perimeter street. So that's mainly the service. So trucks, all the entrances to the parking garage will be off the street and there'll be one right here as it transitions into that Woonorf type condition. So a lot of the um, deliveries and day-to-day -day traffic will really um, uh, be handled with, with this perimeter, these perimeter streets to really help create a, um, 
you know, take some of the volume off this, this Wincopen, this Copen Green. And then this just is another nice slide that really shows that, that promenade coming up from the north and the alley of trees that takes you down into the neighborhood square. This, um, the connection, you'll see a stair connection um, and the ADA pathway, kind of this serpentine um, way. So we're trying to keep that, that ADA connection down to this perimeter streets, the courtyard. So all of these buildings have, you know, really nice courtyard green space, again, trying to, you know, take advantage of the views of the lake, of the openness. There we go. And then this is um, just a great shot. This is that neighborhood square. So that's the main primary park and really some interesting moves. We're working with quite a creative team um, to figure this out, but you've got these, what they call the North Outlook, the South Outlook. So they come kind of like um, right off the buildings that overlook into this, this central lawn, the central square. You can see how the ADA, um, the pathway comes down and just makes some really interesting interesting spaces. And, and what's, what's interesting, I was mentioning the stormwater. So for neighborhood square, you know, we're using porous pavement. Um, the, uh, in the, the further part to the south is actually over the garage. So it's more of a green roof element. So we're just using a lot of different type of stormwaters, filteras on the perimeter streets. Um, so again, using a lot of different stormwater components as we mentioned back in the MOB, that parking lot, it's just runoff right to the lake. This is the same condition. So, um, you know, obviously following states, local regulations, um, and doing some really creative solutions um, with these public spaces with stormwater is, is what we're really shooting for. And this is a great, this, this is a really nice slide. So this is showing, this is the north end, showing that perimeter street. You can see the pool to the right, and it's kind of up on a platform. So that would be, that's the garage below that you can see. So you're gonna be entering, there's like an opening, right screen front into the garage. So it just shows how this um, perimeter street might work and then how, the, how that neighborhood square kind of follows the grade and going down to, to the um, kind of closer to the lakeside elevations. Yeah, uh, you know, one, again, this, this uh, and thanks, Tanya. One thing I'll add is that um, this is still a, a work in progress. And actually uh, in this image, Dick, I think you mentioned the, you know, the contrast between in the building, building <laughs> A was maybe a little much. Um, and I understand this, you got that past the design panel though. Uh, well, as, as this design has evolved, we, uh, we've come to agree. Oh, um, so this is, this actually has, there is actually a reduction in that we were working with the facade materials there. Mm -hmm. We kind of fell in love with the idea of, because the red brick is a very traditional mm -hmm. material around here. So that building originally was going to be all red brick. And we're like, well, that's a little much, feels a little institutional. So we like, you know, mm -hmm. sort of came up with this contrast and, but then it was too much contrast. So. The next iteration you'll see that I think is going to be the final one. We'll have uh, it'll be a different facade treatment, different uh, material treatment that I think you'll uh, you'll find maybe oh, a little more you. pleasing. So, <laughs> but it is uh, we are really you know excited about this project. The um, uh, one of the things that's been really fun about uh, working here for now for I mean I'm in going on year eight, eight or nine here I think um, is the creation of public spaces. Uh, you know the, I mean Colorverse Park. Uh, has really been very well received. Um, Millie Bailey Park has also been uh, very well received by the community. And I think, you know, these, the two that we're working on here are gonna be of different character. Um, we've got different designers and sort of serving a different function. Um, but I think they're, I think they're coming together very well. So it's exciting to be, you know, you know, I mean, I love building, building the buildings where people live and work mm. uh, and eat and shop, but uh, you know, the, the public spaces are really special. And so it's uh, yeah, been really fun good. to work on that. Yeah, I was happy to see the variety of open space and the green roofs and the, it sounds like a wide variety of stormwater management that will, um, you know, be able to accommodate that impervious surface of the parking garage with all of the green on top of it. So that looks good. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, Eric. How many units total is this gonna be? So this project is 675. 
for all in the buildings? Between the three, yeah, the three buildings combined. Um, the building that's on the west side is, is uh, 292, I think, um, 175 in building A, and I think 200 and 208 in building D or E. So roughly 1,000 units total? No, 675 total. Oh, for yeah. the whole thing. So the whole thing, yeah, the three buildings combined, 675. Tina? You had mentioned um, a boardwalk, and I was wondering if the boardwalk was going to be um, scooter friendly, like the, the scooters that we were testing in the fall. Yes, the, uh, the boardwalk will be both scooter, bicycle, and pedestrian friendly. Mm -hmm. But we're going to ask them to reduce the speed to five miles. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, questions? That's just because I like to hot rod it. Yeah, that's right. We can't trust you, Tina. <laughs> we got to limit the speed. It's true. I have a lead foot. <laughs> Andy? Yeah, I got a couple of questions. Overall, I mean, the project looks good. Um, buildings look nice and that. I think it did good with the site. Um, so some of my questions are environmental, um, just for you to, to consider. <clears throat> Because I noticed one thing is, um, you know, even though we are filtering the water, uh, we're increasing the impervious surface, um, but we're going from two outfalls to just one. And I worry about all that water now coming out of one pipe, you know, instead of being diverted into two. Um, and you know, we've had we've had a lot of problem on other properties where. The velocity of the water coming out causes erosion. Um, so I definitely want to bring that to your attention. Just uh, um, you might you might look at that again, but I do worry very much about having only one outfall pipe for this entire development instead of the two that currently are there. And I don't know if, if Tanya, you may be able to speak speak to that uh, better than me, but I'll, I'll take a take a shot. One is I think we're we're actually we're not increasing the impervious surface; we're decreasing the impervious surface because today, it's it's almost completely asphalt with no landscaping right, right. at all. There's a little bit of of pervious surface we're in the former building footprints that originally was impervious, but is now okay. pervious because we knocked down the buildings. Uh, but overall on the site, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Tanya, I think we are. You know, be, between the green roofs, between the new landscaping, between uh, the pervious paving in the areas, uh, I believe we will be actually reducing the amount of pervious surf or impervious surface um, for the overall site. It's, it's not what your environmental concept plan says. Is that okay? Am I, am I misspeaking, <laughs> Tanya? Because um, I mean, today I, 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 I think would the, I would have to 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 verify what the ECP says, but um, that what Greg is saying, it, it sounds accurate. I, I will say um, in your comment, it's really timely. We had a call today with CA staff and SHA. We're you know, just approaching the subject of the outfall of the boardwalk and those impacts to that stream, the conservation area. And they, um, they did ask, so we're gonna be providing all our hydro cal calculations for that outfall for the project so it's not impacting that newly um, restored, uh, improved stream area. But, but the philosophy like MOB is, you know, it's a slow release, it's not a gush. Um, but you know, what you, you, what you make, what you say makes, makes sense. And, um, and it's something that we have to verify throughout this process. So, so think, we are gonna be closely looking at that. It could be that my, my misunderstanding is that I, I believe what maybe character, characterizes impervious surface, like if it's a green roof, it's absorbing water, but I think it may, may still count as impervious. It still counts as impervious because yeah. the water's gotta go eventually down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's like 80% impervious now, so you're adding to it, but um, yeah, so that was my, um, Another concern I had is, um, you know, the um, neighborhoods, um, neighborhood square, um, because basically um, the slope brings it right down to, you cross the street and then you're into the stream. Um, and so I do worry, make sure you really wanna capture as much water as possible um, 
and, and not make it become like a funnel. Um, you know, because you, you are at a higher level. I mean, when, when coping, I mean, the water is going to try to find um, the lowest place possible. And, and given the fact that that area slopes down, um, I just want to make sure that that's considered and that, um, because I don't want that to kind of act as a funnel for, for water pouring down. Um, I'm going to try to think. Let's see, what else did I find in here? So Andy, I think you're onto something because you could create a feature that activated when it rained. That would be really fun. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I actually, I would, I would, you know, I'm sure many of you have been to Cured or been to our office building and seen the, the yeah. uh, you know, what we created. We, that uh, the amenity space in between mm -hmm. the parking garage and Two mm -hmm. Merriweather, um, it actually serves three functions. Yep. So one is it's uh, it's it's um, the stormwater treatment for the site, and it really functions incredibly well. I, I, I've come to really enjoy when there's a huge storm, I always mm -hmm. go and look in downtown and like see how the different parts of, because we've done a lot of restoration for stormwater throughout mm -hmm. the Merriweather District, uh, the open space that, you know, that we've dedicated to CA now, uh, but all the restoration that we did before, um, how that particular one in, in the area one, you know, between the parking garage and, and two Merriweather, how that functions. Um, so that, and it functions very well. I mean, I've gone there when it's been, you know, after one of our crazy, you know, like, four inches an hour, you know, rainstorm that we get every once in a while, and it, it performs great. Um, uh, treats the water, you know, it, it does exactly what it was intended to do. It also serves as uh, the ADA connection, you know, for the site, so it's, you know, that boardwalk um, uh, is an ADA compliant connection, and it's also just a great amenity for, uh, uh, for you know, people to, you know, it's just a nice, nice space. Uh, the smokers particularly seem to like it, but um, uh, so, so, so does everybody else. So it's a nice amenity. Too. Yeah, hey, you actually brought up a real good point because that works very well. But I think one of the reasons that works so well is you have a boardwalk instead of a, um, I'll say an asphalt or, or concrete path. So the water t isn't going to run down the boardwalk. Um, but with the pathway, you know, you've kind of given it a, a way to kind of meander down from Wincopen down to Road A. Um, but, you know, like a boardwalk, does, you're right. If you had like a little bit of a boardwalk in there, then you'd kind of get a break and you could capture that water. Yeah. Just something to think it's, about. Yeah, no, it's a very, it's a very yeah, good point. That, that's, Andy, that's a really good point. And it's something that we're looking at, especially for that promenade, that, that you know, that kind of serpentine, the ADA pathway is looking at using porous um, pavers to help with that. So, you know, doing all kinds of, of moves with materials um, and, and greenery to, to address those address those issues. And I, I would agree. I mean, in that, in that image, it looks kind of like, you know, because there are, there are walls sort of on either side. It does kind of look like it could just be a, mm -hmm. a river, you know, yeah. uh, kind of, you know, when, when, when the rain, when one of those crazy rainstorms comes. So. But, you know, as I said, a boardwalk is a possibility. I mean, it might help solve things. But, um, so I got a slightly different question, and that's on Road B. <clears throat> so Road B is um, projected to intersect um, Little Patuxen Parkway. Um, so I had two concerns there. One is safety distance, um, because it's pretty close to the other one in Copen. Could we rename some of the roads downtown? <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to say. Everything is winning coping down there. So but it's like, um, you know, the street that runs by Little Patuxent, that version of winning coping. Um, it's pretty close to that, and it's pretty close to the entrance exit of the uh, the gas station. So, so I worry about that connection in terms of, of safety and its impact on traffic flow on Little Patuxent Parkway. Um, and then the second thing I worry about is that it's a fairly, actually, a, a fairly steep bank from. Um, Little Patuxen Parkway down to um, actually even um, right where you're building D, um, build, or where eventually you'll build, you know, the new D1. Um, and that seems, I mean, that seems like a very steep slope. Um, and so, so I worry about how that w is going to actually come down from the road to the area. Um, and then once again, You've got this nice path that flows all the water down straight um, from Little Patuxent Parkway down the Ruby. So, just to look at that, um, I don't know when you intend um, 
you know, to do that construction because those two buildings are in their second phase. Um, you okay. know, but that does concern me about the, you know, the safety issue and also the the slope and. Um, yeah, I mean, a couple things. That was, so one is that, that that is proposed as a right in, right out. So there wouldn't be, okay. you know, on the, on the west side of the street, there'd be nobody turning in from, you know, who's mm -hmm. going southbound okay. from the Patuxent. There would be nobody going out and crossing traffic to turn, you know, and go south on that. So it, it is proposed just as right in, right out. Um, in terms of the grade, I don't know if, if Tanya, if you can uh, speak to that at all. Um, no, I, I, I don't have... I don't have enough information, but I, I know that our traffic group is looking at that intersection. Um, it's part of our, our SDP process. So um, you just how traffic moves, the safety, all the points that you brought up, Andy. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, last thing, if this is okay, Janet. I don't have any other hands up, so. Um, so, <clears throat> It would be great, you know, to actually have a pathway from there down, you know, across the stream that links the two lakes down. Um, but that's a pretty steep bank. I and mean, that is a really, really steep, it's even worse than the bank at Little Patuxent Park, I mean, but, um, and I gotta admit, I have a lot of concerns about how you put a pathway there, even with boardwalk, um, and make it ADA because it is so steep and then you hit right immediately into wetlands. Um, I mean, I have, you know, serious concerns about that um, just because of the topology. Um, yeah, and, and I don't want this huge, the problem is I know how big ADA pathways have to be to make, to make it, and I'm thinking like, that's a really, really steep bank to get down. And you're right, it is. It is a, a you know, big grade change from, from there, yeah. you know, down to the, the connect to the pathway. Um, it's something that we, you know, think is important for the project. We really want to make it. I mean, it hasn't been designed yet, mm -hmm. so we, you know, we have to go through that process. We have to get approval not only from, uh, you know, from from Columbia Association to make the connection, but also from uh, State Highway, who has an eas easement right. um, that goes through there. So, uh, you know, until we figure out how, you know, how it's designed and how it, how the connection is made. It's not a done deal, but we, we do think that it's um, an important connection. We very much want to have it have the connectivity again to the to the trail system, mm -hmm. to the you know around Lake Kit, you know up to the Wild Lake. I mean, it's just um, it would be a, it would be a shame if we can't figure out how to make that work. Uh, Dick and then Eric. Yeah, I uh, share Andy's concern, but uh, it is going to take some interesting engineering, and it will be. An important pathway because you're going to have a lot of people who want to get down in the lake that way. Um, one last thing on on uh, parcel A, uh, your north wall uh, where you have that you know platform. That's a big wall. It's like what, about 20 feet high, or uh, no, on the other side, the uh, on the parking side. Um, Parcel A, so Parcel A is the building on the right here, is that what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, it's at the top, the north one, yeah. I think he wants to look at the one where you show the sewer. Yeah, there was, a, there was an earlier it's, one. Yeah. It's the main rendering. Um, Next. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. There's a, that is a huge wall there. You're talking about this? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is, this is um, so part of the parking, I think there's one level of underground parking, mm -hmm. but the rest of the parking is in this structure here. Yeah. And I'm not sure for, for this, you know, serving well, this building. Well, what, what I'm what I'm looking at is it's just uh, it just seems like an enormous barrier. I see you've put some trees along it, but um, one of the things you might want to talk to your architect about is is there any way to just make it less featureless, blank, twenty yeah. foot wall? I mean, it is uh, you know certainly that you know the primary pedestrian. Uh, I mean. Sure, people will be able to, and I'm mm. sure some people will walk will walk back here. But uh, this, you know, the primary primary pedestrian pathway. This is actually mm -hmm. called out in the plan. This is the the Warfield Promenade, mm -hmm. which is actually has you know double double row of trees. Mm -hmm. so the intention is very much for the pedestrian mm -hmm. to be you know here, you know, walking along here to the neighborhood square, and then hopefully. Well, that's a, that's a good point. You won't have a lot of people back there, but it's just you know something to think about. 
Eric? Yeah, two questions. Um, what's the timeline for the current phase and the future phase? And the 600 something units, does that include the future phase also, or is that, or the future phase additional units? No, the future phase um, is additional 100 units uh, plus uh, 80,000, 60,000 square feet of retail. Okay. Um, so that's, that is the future phase. The timing of that um, is, you know, um, like all future phases, it uh, you know, depends on how good your crystal ball is. But, um, you know, we, we don't anticipate it being, uh, you know, too far out in the future. Our hope is to be able to get this, you know, get this going in the timing on this one. So, you know, we're targeting starting construction end of this year, early next year, um, because of the nature of the construction with, uh, you know, the large kind of underground parking. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure work here to do, so it's going to take a little longer than um, our other projects. So we're looking at occupancies for first occupancy in that first phase in, call it mid-2025. So it's a, it's a good you know, more than two year construction process between starting and, and first occupancies, again, because of the nature of construction. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah, Lakey. A comment. Um, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we're in the beginning of the staff coordination as both Tanya and um, Greg have alluded to, but I wanted to say that the pieces that certainly we've heard from the community a lot and, you know, having attended the pre-submission, it was voiced there. The uh, trail connection and the multi-use path connection, I think, are, you know, high on our priority list for the community benefit. So it's certainly interesting to get all of the parts and pieces that are direct benefits to the residents, but I think the open space, the stormwater, and then those trail and path connections are critically important and, and really the focus of, a, of CA staff as we move through the process. So looking forward to navigating the engineering challenges, but I think it can be done and, you know, maybe we can find a really great progressive way to do it and have that be a highlight of the development team. So yeah, thank you. I, I think it would be, it would be a shame if we were not able to make, to figure out how to make it, you know, it's not easy, but lots of stuff that we do is not easy. <laughs> we like, we enjoy the challenge. Well, thank you, Greg, for coming. Oh, I think. Oh. No, thanks, Greg. Good. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you. I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for your time. <clears throat> thank you. you are welcome to stay for the enlightening, you know, I'll, danger I, I, of our I meeting. I'm curious about the the lakefront the Clyde's uh, issue. Really? Um, we're, I'm super excited. We, you know, it took us, you know, Clyde's closed. Gosh, about two years ago, and uh, or a year and a half ago, and we're super excited to have uh, the collective coming in. We just we're in long, it was a long negotiation, but uh, we finally, you know, got the lease signed with them. Um, they should be opening up uh, this summer, and really, that provides just a tremendous amount of energy and activation and something to do with the lakefront. We're super excited about. Also, super excited that they're going to re uh, bring live music back to the lakefront. There, you know, it's not easy to find somebody who does both a restaurant and also wants to have, you know, have a live music venue and they're going to do it. So uh, the Soundry will be coming back now as the Encore, which couldn't be a more fitting name. So I'm <laughs> um, so really excited about that. But but that said, I'm going to go and maybe I'll watch it online, but I can get back to my family. So thank you, Greg. <laughs> so thank you. For coming. Thank you. Okay, our next topic tonight is to discuss the terms of uh, dis uh, the dispersal for the Inner Arbor Trust grant. Would, would this be a good place to place in Ginny's piece since uh, it has to do with the lakefront? Uh, we didn't discuss where I was going to add it onto the end. Oh, I know we never did. I was just wondering if this would be a good time. Well, I was suggesting under community development, uh, operations and whatever, or after, after Inner Arbor. Let's just, let's do Inner Arbor Trust yeah. and we'll come back to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd rather get rid of Inner Arbor. Okay. So this is to talk about ideas for um, contingencies on the grant for Inner Arbor Trust. As we discussed in several budget meetings, um, we allocated money to budget for Inner Arbor Trust. 
However, uh, there were a number of board members who were interested in ensuring that certain conditions were met, and we have yet to determine what those conditions are. Would anyone like to kick us off? Don't you have any idea? Um, I'm happy to start since this was something that was important to me. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I think the first thing I would want to do at some point is, is get staff's opinion on what they feel is appropriate, but based on my experience in, you know, working with nonprofits, you want to, I, the first thing I think is going to be that they need to be in compliance with the easement agreement, um, and they still currently are not. And then having met all the you know, terms of all previous grant agreements, and I don't know where we stand on those, but I would think that would be appropriate as well. I'm sorry, Jess, could you say that again? You faded for me. Sure. Just the second, the last sentence you said. The, the second part was ensuring that they have complied with all current, or I should say previous grant agreements. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Basically, that everything is tied up before more money is granted out. Mm -hmm. Jenny? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Eric? Just, uh, just a quick question for Jess. What, uh, yes, where are they currently not in compliance? Well, that, should there be a second first? No, this is just a discussion. There's no motion. This is a work study, a work session. Oh. So, my, my understanding, unless there's been an update in the past week or so, is that they are still not in compliance with the easement agreement because we don't have audited financial statements for FY19, 20, and 21. Um, question. Jenny? You, you, you said, though, that they would be in compliance with any requirements when, if they got a grant. They didn't get a grant for a couple of years, correct? Well, I know that they received grants in 2020, 2019, and fall of 2018, and each of those had a grant agreement that went along with it. I'm sorry, 2018, 2019, and 2020? Mm-hmm. They actually got money. That was pre-COVID. Hmm? Yeah. Pre-COVID, they got money. But they, they thought it was for the pathway. Um, could you let us know how much money and what it was I for? don't think that's Jess's responsibility oh, okay. to let us know. No, it's all in the drive. It's all in the shared drive. There's a document that has all the details. Um, but right now, according to what I have been able to count, unless I am misunderstanding the nature of some of the grant agreements, um, because we don't have those audited financials, there is $731,000. $887 that we don't have reporting on. Which just from a nonprofit best practices and stewardship of assessment dollars, I think it's very important that we really ensure that everyone is in compliance before more funds are dispersed. Okay, Caitlin? You're muted. Unmute. Okay. Um, you know, just audits weren't always required. Uh, so uh, let me just interrupt right here. This is not a discussion about the compliance or non-compliance. Oh. This is a discussion to, to figure out what we want to put on this money for this agreement. All past agreements, we can figure out. And if we want to say in compliance or not in compliance, we can make that determination. But let's focus on what we would like to see in place before we release this money. Okay, I just, I just, I really don't know exactly what we're, what's being referred to as out of compliance with okay, past well, years we, and things like that. So I have no idea. Yeah. Okay, Lakey's going to speak to that. Uh, so I'm happy to clarify a point of information. I'll ask Susan to weigh in with more detail, but I do want to be clear mm -hmm. that the Inner Arbor Trust is currently out of compliance with our easement agreement. In the easement agreement, there is a section, all this information is on the 
shared driving was uploaded in the original easement agreement that created Inner Arbor Trust. They are to deliver um, annually audited financial statements to CA. Um, so Susan, can you provide more? So I can't speak to the individual grant agreements. Um, Jess was referencing the summary spreadsheet, I assume, that, that's on the shared drive. But Susan, if you'll speak directly to the easement agreement, which is currently out of compliance, I think that we need to be very clear about different agreements. Mm -hmm. Right, so the easement agreement uh, says that uh, Inter Arbor Trust will provide uh, audited financials to CA and their form uh, 990. So uh, those, uh, we got most of the 990s either from the website or they were provided uh, recently, but the um, audited financials have not been provided. There has been no change in that. That's what the easement agreement has said since 2013. And we haven't received them for 2019, 2020, or 2021. Yeah. And, and I, you know, so and 2022 is the end of that is fast approaching, and another audit cycle would be, would be uh, underway soon after April 30. Tina, we used to work um, for a grant maker um, that was also a grant receiver. Um, can I ask us a question, Susan, about our um, at Enterprise? I would have said at our responsibility to our funders when we were a pass-through organization. Um, if we make grants, which to organizations that are not in compliance with past agreements, is there a liability insurance ramifications to that? See, I've got all insurance in my head tonight because of the risk management committee meeting. Do you know? Uh, I, I, I'm not 100% sure I'm following your question. Um, I think the concern would be, um, uh, I, I don't know that there's an insurance concern, more of a reputational concern, and also a concern about just, you know, certainly endorsing the organization when they're out of compliance would be, a, would be a, 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 a something I would not recommend. Okay, thank you. Ginny? Yeah, uh, two questions. One, uh, in the past when CA would give grants to a lot of organizations, Neighbor Ride, the Village and Howard, did they require an audit? The second question is, um, there was a year, at least a year, when the Inner Arbor Trust did not receive any money, and I think maybe another year where they got some money, They're not but it was digging into the No, I'm asking, is that, is that a, a, if a requirement then for an audit when they didn't, if they didn't get any funding? Susan? So the audit requirement is in the easement agreement, not in the grants. So that's, it's in the underlying foundational document that um, you know, helped set up Inner Arbor Trust. It doesn't, it's not part of a grant agreement requirement. Tina? Just from my experience with other nonprofits, typically anytime any organization makes a request for grant funding, um, a typical um, grant application package includes things like the, the organization's articles of incorporation, um, mm -hmm. audited financials, you know, did, did all of those types of organizational structural documents. That's a typical um, grant makers want that stuff each and every time. Jess? Yeah, I agree, Tina, and you're right, that is typically the case. Um, what I don't have information on, and I'm sure we can find out, um, we saw the grant policy, but I don't know what the procedure is for applying for a grant from CA and what the documentation requirements are when you apply. Um, based on the grant agreements that I read, the reporting piece is more of a, I, I think they called it a program evaluation report, basically saying this is how we spent the money. Um, that was, you know, except for there were some that were very specific, like if it was a grant for insurance, it was like a copy of the policy and paperwork. If it was a grant for a pathway, it was specific to that. But the operating grants, the requirements were around sort of like this is how we spent the money. 
And so without the audited financials um, for those past few years, we don't have that information. So I, I think mean, they I could think certainly be given another way, but the, the financials are required for the easement agreement. If they wanted to give like a report with pictures and that kind of thing for the grant agreement, but their audited yeah. financials would still be required under the terms of the easement agreement is the way I understand it. So I think what I'm hearing is that uh, there's general agreement that Inner Arbor Trust needs to be in compliance and follow whatever our procedure is for a grant. Is there anything additional that anyone would like to discuss at this time? Eric. Yeah, one question. Is there anything in the easement agreement that states what should happen should one party be out of compliance for the agreement? Oh, yes. We have not taken those steps, but yes, there's remedy. Hmm. Ashley? Uh, were there requirements about who uh, takes care of the land? Because I remember Dennis had mentioned, or I don't remember, maybe it was Dennis or it was Nina, um, about Columbia Association is donating a certain amount of money towards the care of the land, um, or is that a responsibility of Inner Arbor Trust? Dennis is coming to the mic. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, CA is responsible to until 2024. And it's about a hundred thousand dollar lift per year, depending on if there's some snow and, and um, how many trees go down, et cetera, in that area. Okay, thanks. Jess? Yeah, a question that I thought of when Dennis came to the mic is whether there are any other agreements that we have with the trust around like maintenance or operations, that kind of thing that should be considered and, you know, whether, I just don't know anything about that, but I would imagine that because you guys work so closely, there is some sort of understanding and making sure that that, that is all hunky-dory as well. There is the management plan, which um, CA um, initiated and um, IAT assisted with, and there are some requirements in that plan that we're currently working through with the county, which the county has agreed to put, it comes down to some matting um, in terms of protecting the turf. And the county has agreed to that. There is, um, IAT is struggling a little bit with that right now in terms of some of their usage for some of the smaller events. And we're trying to see, um, to work through that. But our primary concern is to preserve the woods. And um, so secondarily, um, I'm not sure we can activate it for everyone if they can't observe the management plan for the long-term preservation of the woods. But we're in conversations with Nina right now on that. County, had a conversation with the county, met them on site, and it relates to wine in the woods. It's interesting, a little tidbit, so we're talking about 10 by 10 tents, which seems small, but if there's only one person behind there and they're walking behind the table all day, that's a lot of um, impact on the turf. And then if you take three of them and combine them or put them right next to each other, you take a 10 by 10 tent, which is what the county is actually doing, and turn it into a 30 by 10 tent, which is not the case in every instance. But um, so we're working through that right now. So then I would suggest that as part of whatever we come up with, and I don't know how you would phrase it, I guess I would leave that to staff, but that that the IAT is also in compliance with any management plans or, you know, what, however we describe that, that sort of co-working agreement for the woods. So, so that would be my suggestion. Is it just that they're in compliance with everything, all, everything, every, every agreement, every, you know, whatever, so that everything's on the up and up? Uh, Dick? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I understand that there are some other agreements between Inner Arbor and uh, IMA. That and, have nothing to do with our funding of this. Uh, well, at this point, uh, they're owed a good deal of money, apparently, and maybe that is holding up some of the other problems, and so maybe we ought to take a holistic look at their financial situation. I know it's in arbitration right now, um, but uh, that could reflect on why we're not 
it's expensive doing these audits. And so uh, maybe we should wait until that arbitration is completed and any funds that, that they are owed uh, uh, I, I mean, I beg to differ, Dick. That's a completely separate thing. I, I agree with you that we can look at the holistically. If there's rationale for something not being in place, then we can think, you know, staff would certainly consider that, I imagine. But uh, it's it's not ours to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Eric? Well, I guess my question is following up on uh, uh, Dick's Question is: Are there any what are the extent, what are there any extent, um, ex, I can't pronounce the word right now. Circumstances. Ex, extenuating circumstances. Why they're out of compliance? Because um, I'm trying to get a feel for why they're out of compliance. Why they're not um, presenting audited reports. I was going to say Susan has been in direct conversation repeatedly with Nina. So Susan, do you want to address what? Um, the answer has been, and if, if you want to understand the remedy in the agreement, I'm sure Wes can address that section as well, but we haven't taken those steps. We've been in discussion. So, Susan? Yeah. So, um, so keep in mind that the it's, it's now it's for three years. It's FY 2019, FY 2020, and FY 21, and FY 2019 was before the pandemic and FY 2020, you know, was, was very was at the end of the fiscal year. So um, it's my understanding that those um, okay. uh, an accounting firm, an audit firm has been uh, identified, that, but then there have been multiple delays um, related to multiple factors because now three years have to be done at one time. So um, I, I, I don't, I have not, um, understood why uh, FY19 really isn't done at least um, prior to this point. But, but it sounds like they're taking the necessary steps to go to get themselves into compliance. Is that a true statement? I think uh, I, I'm cutting this conversation off. Here's the deal. Mm -hmm. We can put a stipulation on this that they need to be in compliance, or we can discuss at that time, if they're not in compliance, is there some extenuating circumstance that we would like to consider? Mm -hmm. Tonight's conversation is not that night. It's just what? This is just what do we want on these, and whether or not there are extenuating circumstances, we cannot speculate what those might be tonight. So if if that's something, you know, if we want to, we're not voting on this tonight. This is a discussion. So if there are other things that you'd like to have attached to this money, tonight is the night to discuss them. Otherwise, let's not spend time on why or were they are why they are or are not in compliance. I think it's irrelevant to this conversation. What's relevant is what we want to be in place when we release this money. Uh, Tina and then Ginny. One of the things that I think should be attached to any future funding in addition to a full-blown um, contractual grant agreement um, would include um, anticipation, anticipated uses for the funding and um, match, what the ma where the matching funds are coming from. So you're saying you'd like to put a contingency on it that they require matching funds because we do not currently. I, I think it's it, it is it is a common and typical nonprofit best practice, and I think that that's appropriate. Ginny, uh, I have no conditions, other conditions. Okay. All right. Any further conditions that w anyone would like to discuss? I just wanted to add that I put in the chat the things that, that I feel are important, which I already discussed, but just to make it clear. Thank you. But nothing additional besides those things. Well, excuse me, shouldn't the public know what those are? We chat? already discussed all of them. Compliant, they can okay, also okay. see them. They're, no, they're known, okay. Yeah, it's the same thing I said verbally, Ginny. Yeah. I just wrote it down to make okay. it easier for people to, if they wanted to take notes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Next up, we have 10 minutes dedicated to lease at the lakefront. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah. Um, I just would like to know more about exactly what the terms and conditions are. And is it a contract or a lease? It's a lease. Pardon me? A lease. A lease, it, what, what the conditions are. I'd say they're consistent with the terms and conditions for the Clyde's lease, the same space, um, the same approximate dollar value, although that dollar value is phased in, in consideration of the fact that they are a new restaurant operator. So the Clyde's had been there for 20, 40, I don't know how many years, a long time, and they were going concern. So we cut the restaurant operator some slack in the first year to give them a chance to get up and running. Um, of course, we're I, personally. I'd love to see the space activated. Um, it helps CA for it helps residents. It also puts a presence down at the lakefront. CA doesn't have rangers, and so I, I'm I'm really desperately want someone to operate a restaurant and be on site because that helps CA to manage the space. Yeah. Um, so the same same conditions and terms that basically Clyde's had. It although they're a little more stringent. Um, I held out um, July 4th and July 5th for the pavilion. Um, they could still possibly participate as a caterer, but I knew that um, after last July 4th when we helped run that event, I knew that CA would want that date in that pavilion, and so I purposefully held that out as well as the 5th in case there was a rain date. Um, and in terms of the conditions for CA has approval on the furnishings. I'll give you an example, which um, is just generally more strict than it had been in the past and having the prior knowledge of some touch points that we might have had with Clyde's, um, we placed some stricter conditions in this lease. And not onerous by any means, but just CA, that, that space to me is so vitally important to Columbia um, and you, I mean, take a look at what uh, Lakefront North is going to be. Five years from now, that's going to be an incredible. Well, it's already an incredible place. But so we put more more conditions and more um, oversight than we had in the past. But you know, I'm not. Um, you know, we're not down there every day. But I, I definitely want someone down there. Yeah. Could you give us the dates uh, of the con uh, lease? I don't. I honestly, I don't. I don't have memorized. I, I can you know, get back to you with those dates. But I just. I mean that that the that the um, retailer has a right to that property for for what dates? You, you... Um, it's mostly the summer, but I'll get you the dates. And there's some there's some options. For instance, Clyde's had I remember Clyde's had no, a no, wedding no, in I, middle of winter, but I'll have to get you the dates. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Uh, well, here's the problem. I I am not aware of what the terms were with Clyde's, so I can't do this comparison that you're talking about. Um, and I'm just asking for what are the dates, the, the amount of money. I, I don't think anybody disagrees with this is wonderful to have a restaurant there. I was on the liquor board and approved the license for Clyde's, so I, I am. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited about um, this the new restaurant there. It's long overdue. But that's not the issue. The issue is can the public see the, the document? Can the board see that document? It's it's which why it shouldn't be a secret. That's all I'm asking. I, I don't. See it, so, I'll so I will address that. Um, so on that note, I just we've had email exchanges, which obviously are not public. So I, I want to say that obviously the board was updated on March 4th in the email that Dennis Matty sent. Um, if there are. It sounds like you want specific dates and amount of money. I just want to be clear that as a business practice, and my understanding from longtime staff and all policy that I've read, is that leases and contracts are the place that the board intersects is by setting the purchasing policy, right? So the bounds of what staff does operationally. And so this contract was executed fully within the bounds of the purchasing policy that the board set. So it is not a practice to bring um, a contract or a lease in front of this body every time we execute it. Um, we do, I, I 
I can't even imagine if Wes and I tried to count up all the ones that pass through the organization for a variety of reasons. So um, there's not a reason, there's nothing being hidden here. Um, if you want to directly ask for the board to see the agreement, if the majority of the board thinks that mm -hmm. staff time being spent on gathering all of that paperwork together, compiling it, getting it into a shared drive and um, getting that access to the board, then we can work on putting that together. But I, I, but I can't cite, Dennis can't cite, Susan can't cite off the top of our heads details within the agreement I mean, you amended the agenda this evening, so we don't have that at the ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, Dick, I, I, uh, what? Your time's up. It's Dick's well, turn. I'd like to say I'm delighted that we have a tenant in there, and I'm delighted that we have out outdoor you. seating. I think it brings a lot of life to the, to the lakefront, and uh, I'm, like, uh, I'm glad Ginny got him a liquor license because I've had many delightful drinks there. So. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to having some more. And my wife loves to sit out there on a summer day and, and, uh, and dine. Um, so I, I had one question, and that is the last time we were there, we decided not to go back because there was a lot of smoking going on. And uh, we seem to always get downwind of the chain smokers table. And I asked at that time what the smoking policy was and nobody knew. And I hope that that has been handled in, the, uh, uh, in whatever agreement we had. And addressing your point, like he, yeah, ordinarily we don't need to know every single contract. And these are regular, you know, business decisions is to, you know, it's operational. There's no problem there. Mm -hmm. What concerns me is that this is our front yard. This is our lakefront. And you know that the, you know, we get very concerned about, you know, open space and how it's used and we get involved when a tree comes down and I mean, at least Dennis reports But yeah, I think it. the point is we shouldn't be. <sighs> well, I, I, I'm talking right now. I don't think I'm finished. You have 30 um, seconds. When this is over, let me finish what I have to say then. Uh, my concern is that this is something that we should have just known about. I mean, it would have been nice if at the time this came up, knowing how the board feels about this sort of thing, if somebody had just given us a heads up, oh, somebody's moving into Clyde's and they're gonna be looking for an outdoor space, we'd all say that's terrific. And, and it just seems that here we find out two months later that an agreement has been made. And this is just a question of transparency and honesty and I just hope in the future, when these major contracts you come up, up, we get some kind of advance notice, just so we're aware of what's going on. Thank you for giving me all that time. Tina? Dick was not speaking for the whole board there, when he said the board needs you, to know. No, no, we don't, and, and not speaking for the board. In that in that statement, and I want to make sure that's just as clear as what he said. I'm speaking for a number of people. Susan, not the same thing. So, don't make me use the gavel. <laughs> How are you playing? To you? No. So I I um, uh, celebrate uh, I guess 24 years here on the Columbia Association this month. And I've been part of many of these uh, transactions, especially over the last 20 years. And um, this, this one started, you know, we, we had that agreement with Clyde's when I got here and, and far beyond that. That thing expired, renewed, uh, was renegotiated, and never uh, had any ex interaction with the board on that. So when this one started, uh, you know, t two years ago, almost, at least 18, October 2020, it never occurred to me that this was a board matter because it isn't as a matter of practice or policy. And so I have to say that there has nothing to do with a lack of transparency or honesty or anything like that. 
it was what was normal in the course of business for Columbia Association for my entire tenure here and uh, and for and preceding that. So I, I just uh, want to clarify that. Thank you. We have 30 seconds left. Uh, just a question. Um, does the public have a, and this might be a question more for Wes, under HOA laws, does the public have a right to know about this agreement? If they should so, if they should so ask for it? Because as I know there's plenty of residents online and now I'm sure they're pretty curious about what's in the agreement. Yeah, generally speaking, um, these types of contracts are not confidential um, per se. Um, but they would have to comply with the HOA as, as to how and when they make the request for such a document. You have 20 seconds. Uh, yeah, okay. First of all, we don't want to, I don't want to see all these leases. This is open space. It's very, very important. One of our strategic priorities is to protect their open space. When we did Clyde's, or you did Clyde's, there wasn't much of a population here. Now there's an enormous population that uses that lakefront all the time. They care very much about what's happening down there. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm simply saying there's no harm in telling us I've drafted a, a, a document, these are the parameters, these are the conditions, um, and, and we say, great, in a public meeting, the public gets a chance to talk. You did this with the tennis, the swap of land with the tennis and the Banneker issue. I compliment the board and the staff for doing that in a public meeting and voting in a public meeting. I'm simply saying that should have happened here as well. Now you're saying, is there a confidentiality clause you're saying in it, in this document? Is that what not, you just said? No, I did not say that. I said these are not confidential documents. They're not the confidential documents. Okay, so people could file, is, okay, they can't file and ask for this? They could make an appropriate request pursuant to the- Is that what you're saying? To the HOA. And can the board do that? I mean, I wouldn't want a resident to get it and the board not get it. You as the board do not need to- I'm sorry, what? You don't what? need to go through the HOA Act or act pursuant to the HOA Act to get this document. We you're, can you're, just. You're the board. We can ask now right. individually for it. I'll, I'll leave it to Lakey. I'm, I'm not clear. So I, I stated just a moment ago that if the, as our practice is a working agreement, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's my understanding of our working group agreement, that if there's a request for staff to spend time on something that is going to take senior staff dedicating some hours to it that a majority of the board would have the interest. I indicated a few minutes ago, if the majority of the board would like staff to do that, we th there is nothing secret here. So again, you keep saying, what's the harm? And we didn't purposely not bring something to the board. As a business practice, leases are not brought to the board. So this lease was not brought to the board not in a purposeful, intentional way to hide information. I want to be on the record clearly stating that. So again, if the a majority of the board would like staff to dedicate time to pull the agreement, pull all the pending ones, get it together, upload it to the shared drive, then staff will do that. How many As pages, I said a few minutes ago. How many ago. pages is it? I have no idea off the I top mean, this, of my head, Jenny. This, this lease okay, is, we're out of time okay. on this topic. Do you have something new to add, Dick? No, I just say uh, it, all you need is a PDF. You don't have to. There's nothing okay, more to it. Okay, we'll, just we'll, I'll a send PDF a survey on, out. And it's a secretarial job. Just tell <laughs> Janet to send it to the board. That doesn't take a lot. I'd time. rather have a vote in public on it. We're not voting tonight. It's a work I mean, session. Next, next time, then. Than, a P, than an email. Moving on. All right, anything for questions only? Uh, development track. Okay, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed that there were three items on the uh, property uh, on the corner of 108 and you know, Dor Dorsey Overlook. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is uh, they want to remove some specimen trees. Mm -hmm. uh, 
those are important trees. They're run along the highway and they shield the property from the highway. Uh, are we gonna take a position on that or not? The alternative compliance procedures for removal of specimen trees is a technical review by the Department of Planning and Zoning. Mm -hmm. They look at the regulatory compliance mm -hmm. um, and then they look at what the developer is offering as the alternative compliance and mm -hmm. they make the ruling on that. Mm -hmm. So no, we don't typically take a position on that. Um, it's, it's very much a regulatory process through the Department are, of Planning. Are we gonna monitor it or get involved in any way? I mean, I, in the sense that we track whether it gets mm. approved or not, it's being monitored, but. But we're I, not gonna say anything. I, I'm not sure what we say. I mean, the, the purpose of the alternative compliance process is to evaluate a proposal and whether it aligns with the regulatory process or not. And well, that's not our, our regulatory should process. Should our residents get involved in some way or, I mean. Yeah, I mean. How if, would they do if, that? If residents are interested in it, they would reach out to the Department of Planning and Zoning for Howard County. Um, and then they, they would provide comments to the, the staff if they oh, were interested okay. in that. Well, I'll yeah. let them know that. Yeah. Thank you. Andy, <coughs> did you have your hand up, Jim? So, Jessica, oh, yeah. could, Sorry. could you put in some terms what exactly happened at the Board of Appeals for the, the, yeah. the, the yeah. last <laughs> Yes. It, did, it was very kind of strange. And if I appreciate it if you could put it in like layman's I, I will attempt to. Um, so essentially, the Board of Appeal, th this case has been before the Board of Appeals for I think going on a year at this point. And throughout that time, there have been turnover in the Board of Appeals staff. So they currently have a four person Board of Appeals. And they split on a 2 2 vote of whether to, um, whether to uphold the appeal and approve the project or not. And because the my understanding of the lawyerly discussion that occurred at that night meeting is that when that happens, the case is automatically dismissed. Um, and they, because they knew they had a fifth member who would be appointed this month, um, my understanding is that the Howard County Office of Law said that individual could listen to the entire case and perform the fifth vote so that it's decided. Okay. So I, I believe that is the procedural elements if I was correctly listening to the Office of Law explaining the procedures, so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Jenny? Um, actually, uh, no, go ahead. I had a question for another thing, board priority here. Anything under questions only is fair game. Yeah, okay. Um, we had talked about, on the broad board priority review, we had talked about uh, having, well, we actually had it on agenda, the Howard County by design, uh, you know, update. And uh, I think the uh, county staff wasn't available, so we took it off uh, and put in other things. But I'm wondering if we couldn't go back to getting somebody from county DPZ or, you know, to, to talk about where, where are they on the Howard County uh, by design. Well, um, if you will have read the development tracker, I did update a new section to kind of keep you guys updated on some of the other yeah, things yeah, happening, sure. um, including Hope by Design. Um, that process is restarting. So next week, I believe we'll get one of the chapters that are coming out of the, the 2022 public engagement process. So after next week, there will be actually something to present and discuss. Uh, so. Um, we'll start providing, you know, staff will start providing updates through our typical processes on, on what's going on with that and where you guys can access more information. Do you see any benefit of having the county presenting? What not, the, not at this time, because I, I think you kind of you kind of want to make sure you're actually seeing what's coming out, because otherwise what you would get is a presentation on everything that just happened in the last year. Okay. Um, I can... Okay. Trying to remember the most recent thing that came out was actually a, a recap of all the input that they received in the last year. And that's a pretty lengthy document that Howard County just put out. And so I can send that to you if you wanna kinda do the recap. Okay. Um, and then we'll keep you updated as it moves forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Hi. a meeting coming up uh, that I just applied yes. for. I was just looking for it right now. It's on the 24th or? Yes, yeah, so there are, um, there are some, because of the, Next week, they will release the Dynamic Neighborhoods chapter, which focuses on housing. And you can now currently sign up for 
the public meetings um, and discussions to discuss that chapter. Um, that was sort of released a few days ago, so I haven't had a nice to, chance to wrap that for you, but um, we'll provide the, the updates um, as they come in. Thank you. Eric? Yeah, a question on HB uh, 1060. I noticed the status has changed to we will continue to monitor the bill. Um, does that shift our uh, is that a shift in our lobby, lobbying strategy on this? Or are we still lobbying uh, to make changes to that bill? Um, so we did submit an amendment that CA and the villages would be carved out of, um, of the entirety of the bill. Um, and that is our current position. We have not changed it, um, but we are still continuing to monitor um, where we are at. Right now, it's still a very dynamic um, situation. It's very fluid. Um, so it's my understanding that the, both that bill and all the other bills will be voted on um, or have hearings on them in the next week or so. Andy? Actually, I have a question for Dennis on his report. Um, yeah, the Pond Management Sustainability Solution, the algae. What, what was that? I was hoping you'd ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I was wondering, maybe it'll apply to like Lake Elk Horn or? <laughs> uh, it's not quite. Not quite. Uh, okay. John McCoy found a firm that basically filters the algae out of a pond and converts that into a biofuel. Oh. So we test, uh, did a test run at Donnelly Pond, and I was out there. It wasn't ready to drink, uh, but it was <laughs> noticeably clearer. And the pot, we're trying to think about whether or not that's a possibility for some of the ponds in the heat of the summer. Okay. But it was, it was it wasn't clearly clearer, but it was definitely, you could definitely see where they had done some work. It was a three or four day test at their expense. Of course, they'd like to get paid for it in the future. <laughs> Um, but you know how long it's going to last, and so it's, it's. I think it's worth a trial run. Um, so that's. But that was the one in here. I was hoping somebody would ask me about. Dennis, any sense of what that costs? I don't know yet. Now, how does it work? Uh, they do it in it's, the pond, not just in two buckets. I take it. Um, so they had a probably an eight by sixteen foot trailer mm -hmm. that was full of equipment, and stuff's going up and down, and wheels are turning. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stuff is spinning and. Because I walked in there and, and took a look at it, um, it was an interesting process. Um, but it's not—it's uh, not like a pool filter. Mm -hmm. um, but that's probably the closest analogy to, the, to what. So is this just for small ponds, or is this something that you could it do? Wouldn't, a... It wouldn't be scaled for a lake. Uh -huh. It'd be for a pond. Mm -hmm. Jenny, are you filming this and then you'll show it to us at some point? <laughs> we did. We did get some film for this. So. Uh huh. Okay. I think a lot of people would be interested in that. Thanks, Dennis. I just wanted to congratulate Chompers for a mention in the Howard Hughes plan. Mm -hmm. so, you know. yes. <laughs> 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 All right, any other questions? I, I just wanted to tell Lakey that um, I, uh, I enjoyed the um, Columbia Archives um, wall at Supreme Sports Club. And yes. There have been a couple of comments from other people too there. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like nice to, to see the exhibit from the archives. Yes, and thank you for pointing that out. Um, I actually was there earlier this week and got to see the full installation. But um, we have gotten, uh, I was meeting with Tavia, the GM, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from both members and employees have really enjoyed seeing it as well. Um, and yes, Dennis, I'm gonna take the softball. It is so awesome if you go in, it has a lot of time capsule type pictures and there's a key photo of our very own Dennis Maddy, not only in a tie, but seemingly decades ago, though when I made that comment in a group meeting, Dennis said, why are you saying it was decades ago? <laughs> but anyway, it's a great installation and it's part of the process as Dan has mentioned before at each of the three fitness clubs. We um, have archives, multicultural and the art center and they'll each be at a club for a month and then they'll move. So regardless of the club you go to, you'll have the opportunity to see all three. And again, having that cross-functional you know, exposure to what we do and what the parts of CA are. And, and where is it now? At Supreme. It's the archives one is at Supreme. Mm -hmm. And they've got some like 
advertising from the grand opening in the 70s. Like it's, there's lots of 80s leg warmers and Nautilus machines. I, I loved it, it was fun. Leg warmers, yeah. All right, proposed new topics. Anything. Would oh, this sorry. be for the next agenda? What should go on there? What, what I'm asking is, I'd like to have a vote on whether. No, we... I'd like you to add it to the agenda form and send it. No, I'm just okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the topic we just discussed about uh, making the uh, oh, well, uh, lease so available. Actually, I'd like to have it for a vote on the next agenda. Because you're right, we, this was discussion. This wasn't. This was fun. discussion. Well, point, except that uh, we do. Leggy's point of. Uh, uh, does the majority of board agree? It's a valid point. Uh, I don't. I don't think we need to have a vote on it, though. I think I could just send a survey out. But then, what is I can put a question on there. Do you want this to be announced at a meeting? Would that work for you? I could put add a question to the survey. Do you want it to be announced at a meeting? Well, well. Okay. So here's the deal with adding agenda items to the next meeting: is that you it needs to be time sensitive, which I don't think this is since it's signed already. And two, you need to get a majority of the board to support it. So okay. I don't think it meets the criteria of being time well, sensitive. Well, you're going to send out one of your. I will send things. a survey. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That should do it. All right. Um, thank you, everyone who attended in person tonight. It feels weird to be back, but <laughs> um, and thank you to everyone online as well. Um, good to get an update on the development plans. Uh, just keep in mind that if you have um, Actually, let me take a look at what's next. I, I wanted to mention to everyone, there is a Visionary Women exhibit opening at the Art Center, and they have a reception this Saturday at 1 o'clock. Oh. So if you are interested in seeing that, they always have lovely mm -hmm. um, exhibits. Um, okay, audit committee meeting is Monday, March 21st at 7, in-person meeting only. Uh, next board meeting, March 24th at 7, that will be hybrid. And we will have a vote on the easements. So if you have any remaining or questions that come up later, please um, try to get those answered before that meeting so that we can vote on it. Um, in addition, there are two additional votes at that meeting. One is for minority business enterprise program policy provisions, and the other is for grants policy. Uh, or, sorry. Those are not votes. I was just about backing to say up, yes. backing <laughs> up. <laughs> Scratch that discussion. Sorry. Yeah. yeah right. uh, discussion around those two things, um, as well as the financials that come from the audit committee meeting. Uh, all right. And then the only other, yeah, that was it. Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? I'm so moved. Ginny moves. Second. Andy seconds. Any objections? Nope. Okay, meeting adjourned at 9.35. Good night, everyone.